India's market news headquarters. Cutting edge analysis. Influential insights. Market moving intelligence. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. Good morning. You're with us here on a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. It's a fresh new week, Monday morning. We are coming to you live from the CNBC TV 18 Motil Oswal Studios. I am Prashant with me, my colleagues Surbi and Nigel. Guys, hi, good morning. Hi, morning folks. Morning. And before anything else, it's beginning to feel a lot like Diwali, if I could say. The festivities are here. I'm sure a lot of our viewers, I'm sure you gentlemen had your share of uh, the first round of the parties, right? <laughs> and the market has been a little tough, uh, yeah. for sure. But I think the sentiment is positive. We have a lot to celebrate. It is a season of light and joy. And maybe some of that will rub off on the street as well. Well, that's the hope. So let's get straight to the action. <clears throat> no no help. I mean, the festival is absolutely right. I mean, uh, the <laughs> the first round of parties and order. But markets, we could have had some help from markets as yeah. well. And that at the margin may have soured the mood a little bit. But, you know, uh, we're we hoping that maybe the bulk of the damage is behind. And... Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll talk more about this. Let's just first take stock, right? I mean, what has happened from the all-time highs as far as indices are concerned? Uh, so the Nifty, Bank Nifty, mid-cap and small-cap indices all up on your screen. The mid- and small-cap indices reaching the 10% loss mark from the from their respective highs. The Nifty is down about 8. The Bank Nifty is down about 7.5%. So this is the damage that we've seen so far. Now, uh, you know, we've had uh, sharp losses in the broader market in the Nifty. And uh, the hope is, as we begin this new session, uh, that uh, the bulk of the damage is behind. The market needs to take it step by step. We need to first see a positive daily close, as we always uh, uh, say. I mean, that's the first step. And then you kind of build on and climb above uh, the hourly, daily averages, etc. Flows have been pretty uh, spectacularly sort of negative and positive, right? That's a number. Those are not minus 1 and 0 0.09. Uh, lack, the unit is lakh crores. 1 lakh crore worth of selling of stocks in October so far from FIIs, and almost all of it mopped up by local investors. The big question that, you know, I've been sort of asking for the last few days has been, uh, will foreign selling start to abate? Because if it does not, along with all the QIPs and uh, IPOs, etc., local mutual funds who've been doing all this buying and mopping up the stock will run, out, will run out of cash at the margin. And incremental buying or selling is all what matters. Uh, and that decides the uh, sort of the incremental price as well, whether the markets go up or go down. And the hope is, and I really think, if the, a large part of the selling has been because of China, uh, I mean, I think uh, the bulk of it perhaps is already done. About $12 billion has left the shores. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, maybe a large part of it... Uh, Part of it is down. Friday, of course, we saw a negative number, but it was smaller than what we've seen over the last couple of days. Small mercies, silver linings. This, uh, you know, but that's essentially what you're hanging on to right now. Wall Street on Friday, it was uh, absolutely flat. Nasdaq actually was up about 0.5 odd percent. Wix went up six percent. We're back at about 20.3. Uh, yields are up, and uh, you know, 4.24. Actually, it's interesting. It's almost been a month since the Fed cut interest rates by 50 basis points. And in the same time period, bond deals have moved up by, I think, almost 75 odd basis points or so. So uh, it's like bond market is saying something else. And of course, you've got U.S. Uh, uh, the, the Fed path, which is, of course, indicating that they want to cut. Uh, and we'll talk more about this. What is the bond market pricing? And there was, of course, the Trump probability of Trump coming in, uh, uh, sort of getting elected uh, in a few days from now. Uh, and and it's, it's a close rate, but there also perhaps, I think, is inflation expectations, reflation, really. Dollar index, 104.26 is where uh, that left off. Oil price is 2% higher. There are developments in the Middle East, 76. We'll uh, talk more about that. Uh, the week ahead, uh, lots of uh, things. So U.S. election developments, I think, will be closely tracked. Uh, lots of earnings, 40% 40, 40 of S&P uh, S &P companies report earnings, five of the magnificent seven stocks. And, of course, FOMC, we won't hear from many Fed speakers because they go into the blackout period ahead of the November 7th FOMC meeting. Levels to watch, just to sort of uh, tie this in, the downside target, the downside level, the first one is uh, about 23,700 uh, as far as the Nifty is concerned. On the upside, the 40 hourly exponential is uh, 24,487. So this is essentially the range uh, for the market, really. And we need to get above these hourly averages 
And then, of course, the daily, and then we start to talk about whether the bulk of the damage is behind and market wants to turn. The bank nifty broke below the low of 51,107 on Friday. Immediate downside levels to watch on the nifty bank are 5194. And on the way up, resistance comes in at 51,130, which is the 40 hourly exponential moving average. So that's essentially what we are looking at. Gift Nifty will come up on your screen. It's indicating a bump, a higher start, about 50 odd points worth for now. Surbhi. Oh, the bulls will take that with both hands, right? If we get a little bit of that green that the implied open is right now indicating, yeah. considering how weak. Uh, the last couple of uh, days and weeks actually have been. Now, uh, just some updates. So the global setup is looking actually fairly benign because you had that rally on the NASDAQ. And this morning, most of our neighborhood markets are actually flashing green, including Japan, where there has been uh, the ruling LDP party losing its majority. But it's a long expected line, so it's not really shocking the market at all. So Japan's cruising along, going ahead. There's some buying in mainland China, some buying in uh, Hong Kong as well this morning. Oil is the other very positive headline for us. Look at the tumble in oil prices today. Oil has fallen about 4.2% uh, from the start of trade this morning, Asian trade this morning. And that's a bit of a relief rally because the strikes that happened, remain, uh, remember Israel did finally strike back at Iran, but it did not target the oil infrastructure or the nuclear facilities. So it seems that for now, uh, that level of escalation and you know, oil barrels moving out, perhaps that fear is immediately out of the market. But you never know, it's always tentative. Right now, of course, that queue is very positive. The entire gain of last week has been wiped out this morning on oil. Okay, now for us, uh, four consecutive weeks of losses, five consecutive days of selling. All the headlines are quite negative. The Nifty has now come down to a level of almost 24,100, uh, trading well below, of course, the 100 DMA as well. The VIX in India also shot up, uh, you know, uh, on Friday as well and overall last week. On Friday, the VIX was up almost 5% higher, and for the week, the VIX moved up almost 12%. It just indicates a sense of nervousness and anxiety that seems to be out there in the market. From the peak, Nifty is down about 8%. Bank Nifty is down about a little less than 7%. Uh, mid caps and small caps have lost almost 9, 9.5%. Nine Technically, let's see if that 10% you know, technical correction happens or not. Uh, FII's, again, we had a sell figure on Friday. It wasn't as big as what we've seen in the last couple of days, but you know, nonetheless, it's still about 3,000 odd crores. So Prashant's point is very well taken that if the extent of the selling doesn't ease, then will domestic institutions continue to be able to offset the kind of FPI uh, you know, negativity that we're getting? So those are the numbers from Friday. Results, results, and more results. And today, you're going to hear a lot of chatter about asset quality. And we have a mixed picture. Let's start off with the good. ICICI Bank standing tall, sparkling results at a time when there's so much of talk about slippages, asset quality concerns. Look at what the bank has done. The gross NPA ratio has actually improved. It's fallen to 1.97. The slippage ratio has improved. From 1.9, it's come down to 1.6. And, uh, of course, the net interest income, PAT, all of that is above post. class numbers from ICICI Bank. But then come the other lenders. IDFC Bank, Credit Access Grameen has been a real, real shocker and howler. And even Bandhan Bank, you'll hear a lot more about asset quality issues. And we'll discuss a lot of this with some of the managements as well. For IDFC Bank, the credit cost guidance for the full year has been increased from 1.65 to, you know, over 2%. Bandhan, same situation over here, sharp rise in GNPA. And the slippage ratio has gone up as well. And Credit Access Grameen, watch out for this stock today. Because not only has the GNPA gone up, they have gone ahead and revised their credit cost guidance for the entire year in a very big way. Uh, they are saying that instead of, uh, you know, about 22 to 2.4%, credit cost can now touch 5%. That's the extent of credit quality, uh, asset quality pain, pain that's showing up in some of these uh, numbers, particularly wherever the MFI uh, portfolio is pretty big. But then you've got Bank of Baroda, Sriram Finance, more steady picture over there. Some of the, you know, beyond BFSI, if you look at numbers, and you've got some weak headlines coming in from Coal India, and I will tell us a little more about that, from, you know, Interglobe Aviation, even DLF, not that great. Uh, and aside of all the earnings, keep Access Bank on your radar because of the Max Life deal. SEBI has shot off a show cause notice to the bank and some of its subsidiaries as well, asking for certain explanations. So, I mean, aside of earnings, that could be a stock on the radar. But primarily, I think we'll just have to get through the earnings and uh, figure out if the market is willing to look at the glass more full than empty. But I think, yeah, critical levels ahead, Nigel. Well, that's right. You know, we've seen a bit of a correction in the headline index. But my gut is that it's a good time to buy good quality stocks in the longer duration. And particularly for companies that are delivering good numbers. So let's run you through a few data points then that I've uh, pulled up. Over the weekend, yes, we had that geopolitical skirmish that did take place. And that, in fact, obviously has soured mood, but it's not had a big impact on financials, whether it's the equity markets or whether it's on crude oil prices as well. Three big points with regard to Friday's trading session. It was a weak one, for sure it was. But institutions, actually, they were net buyers. In fact, in the last week, the FI net 
cell number has reduced if you compare it to the previous week. So on the institutional side, you know, things are not that bad in comparison to what we have been talking about. Next up, we had a sharp fall, but the volumes were not enormously high. For the kind of selling we had in Friday's trading session, well, the traded value was more or less in line with what we saw in the five sessions prior, prior to Friday's session as well. So the fall didn't come on very, very large volumes. And what about the FIs? How are their positions? Well, on index futures, they went ahead, they added close to 8,500 long contracts. And on the short side, they covered close to 10,000 contracts. And if you pull up the chart, you'll see that in this correction that we've been seeing, well, the FIs, they've been gradually cutting their short positions from around 1.7 lakh contracts on the short side. That's come down to around 1.3 lakh contracts. So in this fall, they're actually covering short positions. If they were very confident that we're going to see a bigger drawdown, then that wouldn't happen. So I'll take that data point actually positively. Moving to the options data, then we have two strikes that are fairly active. The 24,200 call, that was very active. And on the downside, the 23,500 put. Now, in this particular strike, the premiums are around 150 rupees. So the near-term resistance will come in at around the 24,350. We're likely to see a 40, 50 point gap up. I think that we, it gets sold into in some point of time. But I'm not ruling an intraday bounce because we have corrected close to 8%. Last four weeks, we have been on the losing end. So what are the levels we are looking at? The near-term support, that's at around this 23,900 to around 24,000 odd mark. If we break that, you know, there's a lot of talk that this 200 DMA is coming. But I think it won't be a straight line down there if in case we're going to go and test that. I'm not ruling out a possibility that in the first half of trade today, we do see some kind of selling and then we make some kind of a support level. Let's see whether or not that works out. The resistance though comes in at around 24,550. You'll want to get past the 24,350 first and then head to that mark. Stocks that I'm looking at, well, even in Friday's uh, trading session, some of these companies, they didn't get absolutely battered. So we'll have to keep an eye out on some of these large banking names that have actually delivered good numbers. ICICI Bank, HDFC Bank, as well as Axis Bank, put it together, that's 60% of the Nifty Bank. So let's get a couple of levels up on the Nifty Bank uh, itself. The 100 as well as the 200 DMA, extremely important. That'll be a bit of a resistance mark, the 100 DMA. Well, the 200 DMA is far deeper out there. So we're starting in the green. I don't think you should chase the opening. Intraday dip could come about. And in the near term, we could have some kind of a fight from the lows of the day. So let's see how that works. All right. Uh, so lots to track. And we'll do that in our, uh, you know, uh, earnings uh, are going to be big ones. And earnings, single stock reactions have been so large, right? Here's the CNBC TV 18 exclusive. The RBA governor, Shakti Kanta Das, has been ranked as the top central banker by US-based Global Finance magazine. My colleague Malvika Jain met, up, met with him in Washington, D.C., and the governor sounded optimistic on growth, he said, while the festive season demand paints a mixed picture. The economy is doing well with positives outweighing the negatives. The governor is also confident of rural demand revival on the back of a good rabi crop harvest. Listen in. You see, I don't want to, you know, sort of... Uh... I'm not in the game of one-upmanship. Sure. But last year, in all seriousness, when we projected uh, higher growth, I think the opinion outside was that RBI was being too optimistic. But ultimately, the growth number which came was even higher than what we had uh, projected. Today, as I'm talking to you, in all seriousness, you see there are some mixed signals. The festival season, the first quarter, you know, the growth rate was lower, lower than what we had expected. Second quarter numbers will come only at the end of November. Second quarter also there were some unseasonal rains in the month of August, etc. Some activities got uh, affected. But even in the festive season, there is some narrative that perhaps the sales figures and certain things have uh, slowed down. But what I would like to emphasize is that there are mixed signals. There are pluses. There are you know there are some positives. There are some negatives. But I think the positives significantly outweigh the negatives. The so-called, I'll just complete, the so-called slowdown in certain areas, that has been significant, that is getting, you know, that is outweighed by the kind of positives that we are getting. And if I can just take half a minute more. You see, agriculture sector is doing exceedingly well this year, thanks to a very good monsoon. The expectation on Ravi crop is very good. Rural demand has now revived. That is one area which was languishing for a long time. Even the first quarter GDP number this year at 6.7, which was lower than our estimate of 7.1. Even there, the consumption demand has shown significant revival. I think if I remember correctly, it was about 7.4 or 7.5, something in that region. 
Another thing that you talked about and is obviously at the top of RBI's agenda is inflation control. You've indicated time and again that until and unless uh, we see uh, inflation in the four, round over 4% region, a rate cut is completely ruled out. If we continue to see growth, as you are expecting that the momentum will continue, so do we assume that rate cuts would not happen? Inflation management by stability is our primary responsibility, keeping in mind the objective of growth. At the moment, as we stated in the last monetary policy statement, as I have said, the growth and inflation component of our mandates are well balanced. They are well poised. That, so therefore, we changed our stance to neutral. Now we have flexibility. We have now flexibility to watch the incoming trends and to sort of assess the evolving outlook and decide on what policy we will take. Now, growth is doing well. Okay, the governor is talking about some uh, really important issues and uh, you can hear from the RBA governor on navigating multiple shocks like COVID pandemic and uh, the Ukraine war, domestic growth concerns in the festive season and other issue is, issues as he speaks to CNBC TV 18 after being awarded uh, and uh, voted top central banker by US-based global finance magazine for the second time. Catch expert, excerpts from the exclusive uh, interaction all day long only on CNBC TV 18. Okay, well, uh, strap up because we have a busy, busy show lined up. So here's what you can expect over the next hour, hour and a half. At 8.40, we have Jasbir Singh, Gujral of Sirma SGS to talk about their second quarter performance. Uh, 9 o'clock, it's a BFSI full throttle. So many numbers coming through. So what does Q2 tell us? Digant Haria joins in with some perspective on uh, the Q2 report card so far. At 9.20, we have Tahir Badshah joining in as our market master of the day. And then uh, at 9.30, we get chatting with the management of JSW Steel. They'll talk about the second quarter performance and, of course, the outlook going forward. And then it's back-to-back -back BFSI, starting with Arul Selvan of Cholamandalam Investment and Finance. Uh, he joins in at about 9.40. Then we get chatting with the V. Vedinathan of IDFC First Bank, talk about some of these asset quality concerns and what the second half uh, outlook is like. 10 a.m., we'll uh, be chatting with Bandhan Bank. Uh, again, on the Q2 performance, asset quality issues and whether this is a, just a temporary blip. And then towards the end of the show, Lata gets chatting with uh, Mr. Uh, Devadatta Chand of Bank of Baroda. Bank of Baroda actually has come up with good numbers, no asset quality, not the kind of asset quality pain that we are seeing in other lenders. So we get an outlook from the PSU Bank at around 10.15. Well, time to slip into a short break. We've got a lot of stocks lined up for you on the other side in our special top 10 segment. We'll look at ICICI Bank, RDC, Sriram Finance, Bank of Baroda, ITD Cementation. All of them will be reacting to positive news flow. While we have Coal India, Interglobe, DLF, IDFC First Bank and Bandhan Bank that will be reacting to negative news flow. Slip into that break, come back. We'll get into further detail on all of these names. Welcome back. Let's straight away get to our uh, stock list of the day. As you've guessed it, it's packed with a lot of earnings. And we have Abhishek uh, starting up. He's had a really busy weekend with a lot of these BFI, BFSI numbers. Guys, good morning to all of you as well. Uh, Abhishek, let's start with the good ICICI Bank. Uh, well, ICICI Bank has outperformed peers with respect to many parameters like, uh, you know, slippages coming down, uh, net interest margin remaining stable, as well as the fact that asset quality is one of the best that you are seeing in the last 10 years or even more. So, gross NP ratio is now below the 2% mark at 1.97% versus 2.15% in the previous quarter. Operating efficiency is one of the best in the last seven quarters. Cost to income ratio is now at 38.6% versus 39.7% in the previous quarter. Annualized slippage ratio is at 50 quarter low coming in at 1.59% uh, versus 1.93% while the industry is facing asset quality issues with respect to slippages ICSI Bank has been able to improve its slippage ratio which, uh, which is heartening to see. Quarterly subsidiaries uh, path uh, you know is at all time high of 2620 crore led by ICSI securities uh, over there and net interest margin on the flip side is at 9 quarter low coming in at 4.27% versus 4.35% in the previous quarter. Write off is at 11 quarter high at about 3,300 octroes. In terms of the PNL, both the ANA and PACT is a beat on our poll. Back to you. All right.
Abhishek, thanks a lot for that. I'm looking at Coal India. The numbers look weak in comparison to what the street was working with. On the top line, there's a decline of closure around 6.5%. Though the other operating income was high, so that's what gave some kind of support to the top line. Well, in terms of offtake, well, it came in down by closure on 3.5%, but that provisional number was already available with us. E-auction as a percentage of the total mix is holding at around 9% odd. The problem was in realizations because that came down by closure on 5.8% odd. And the disappointment is on the FSA realizations per ton which came in down by closure on 5.2% on a year-on-year -year basis, telling you that the mix actually was unfavorable. E-auction, or more or less on expected lines, well, that was down by closure on 13% on a year-on-year -year basis. It was encouraging to see, though, on a sequential basis, it was up closure around 2.5%. 2 but the blended realization was a bit of a disappointment. Now, e-auction realization as a percentage of FSA, well, that premium is at around 69%. Remember... I, you know, a few quarters ago, it was more than 100%. But the street is hoping that the second half of the year, you do see some kind of recovery, both on volumes as well as on realizations. Operating profit was a miss. You had margin compression out there because they sold less, but the contractual expenditure went up. Other expenditure as well was mildly higher. And that's what led the profit number to see a degrowth. The bright spot, though, is that they have announced a dividend of around 15.75 rupees per share. Stock starts off in the red and then gets some support from this dividend announcement. But let's go back to Abhishek. He's here to tell us about REC, Sri Ram Finance, as well as Bank of Baroda. Abhishek, take it away. Well, REC, the PNL was positive. Net interest margin has come in at eight quarter high of 3.66%. The spreads are at nine quarter high, coming in at 2.98% uh, versus 2.74% in the same quarter last year and about 2.94% in the previous quarter. Asset quality continues to improve. Gross NP ratio is down to 2.53 versus 2.6%. Now, AM growth is at 15.15%. And given the standard that it has set earlier, this 15% YOY growth looks to be, uh, you know, the slowest growth in last six quarters. Shiram Finance, uh, the asset quality has improved over there. Gross NP ratio is down to 5.32 versus 5.39% in the previous quarter. Versus its peer, you know, Chola actually reported deterioration in asset quality. This number looks to be on the better side. Net interest margin declined sequentially. It declined to 8.74 versus 8.79% in the previous quarter. Disbursals were strong at 15% uh, YOY and about 6% sequentially. So disbursal to AM ratio that I calculate remains steady at 24% versus 20 22.8% in the previous quarter. AM growth is also healthy at almost 20% YOY and about 4% sequentially. While uh, Bank of Baroda, the asset quality is one of the best that you are seeing in the last 10 years or even more. Annualized credit cost has remained below 1% for them in the last 10 quarters in a row. So gross NP ratio is down by 38 basis points sequentially to 2.5%. Annualized slippage ratio is at 1.09% versus 1.13%. It's the lowest that you are seeing in the last three quarters and second lowest that you are seeing for Bank of Baroda in last 16 quarters. Annualized credit cost, uh, that is at 0.6% versus 0.5% in the previous quarter and about 0.9% in the same quarter last year. So 10, quarter low, uh, 10 quarters in a row, you know, they have been seeing annualized credit cost at less than 1%. In terms of the PNL, the NI is slightly below our poll. However, thanks to other income and recoveries that they have seen in few accounts, uh, the PAT is way ahead of our poll. Back to you. All right. Uh, loss of financials, REC, Sriram, Bank of Baroda, uh, and more coming. Abhishek, uh, thanks for that for now. Coming back to you, but Indigo reported numbers as well. Uh, they reported a net loss which was larger than what was expected. Vinny, take it away. So yes, they reported a net loss this time of 988 crores, which is a loss that they reported for the first time after seven quarters. Uh, last year, there was a profit of 188 crores. Even the revenue growth, that's been uh, the subdued and lowest revenue growth that the company has seen in almost 14 quarters, coming in just at 13.5%. Margins obviously also have seen a contraction 14.3% versus 16.4%. This is the EBITDA margin. What impacted the uh, profits of the company and overall the performance of of the company increased costs that is fuel cost that's increased by 13 percent approximately while repair and maintenance cost of aircraft that's also seen an increase of 29 percent so that is the main impact plus forex of around uh, 2460 crores which is impacting the profitability of the company um, other than that grounding which the company is talking about grounding of aircrafts so that is the amount is currently uh, the number of flights that are grounded is around in the high 60s they aim to bring it down
down to sub 40 by the beginning of FY26. So that's something that we should be watching out for in terms of the guidance from the company. Kotak now has maintained their buy call target price of 5,200, but they have lowered their FY27 estimate by 10%. Uh, Goldman Sachs also has maintained a buy call target price of 4,800, and they've cut the target price to 4,800. And similarly, Jefferies also has cut the target price. The new target price is 5,100. So we're expecting Indigo to open in uh, in the red, given that this they've reported a loss for the first time in almost seven quarters. Mm, yeah, not looking too good. Uh, stock's about 10, 14 percent off the peak, but nonetheless, I think the, this rise in cost could be a little more than what the market had penciled in. Vinny got it. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's uh, look at DLF now. Sonal is joining in for this one. Uh, Sonal, weak trends for DLF this quarter? Oh, yes, it is. It, in fact, their bookings came in at 17 quarter low and it was a decline of almost 89% on a sequential basis. The bookings were down 69% on a YY basis that came in at 692 crore rupees. The company says it was because of moderation in sales on account of delay in receiving requisite approvals for new product launches. So there were no new product launches or project launches that the company saw this quarter. Uh, their operating cash flow saw a decline of 34% on a quarter-on-quarter uh, -quarter basis. Their collections were down 5% by Y, 25% sequentially to come in at 2,370 crore rupees. However, the company says going forward in the second half, quarterly run rate would be around 3,000 crore rupees for quarterly collections. So their outlook is strong because they say they've got the project approvals now, but second quarter was weak for the company. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot for that, uh, Sonal. Well, let's go back to Abhishek. He's tracking IDFC First Bank and Bandhan Bank. Abhishek, tell us about both these two. Well, both of them have seen stress rising on Agile this time around. So IDFC First Bank, the stress has weighed on the earnings and they have increased the credit cost guidance for FI25. So FI25 credit cost is uh, now expected to be at 2.25% versus 1.65% uh, that they had given out earlier with respect to the guidance. Uh, the asset quality deteriorated slippages came in at 2030 crore. Now this is a 13 quarter high quarterly slippage run rate that they have seen. Annualized slippage ratio of 3.7% is perhaps a 10 quarter high for them. In terms of the key ratio, the return on asset, one of the key metric in the banking sector uh, is at uh, 13 quarter low of just 0.25% versus 0.91% in the previous quarter. With respect to Bandhan Bank, again, asset quality deteriorates and stress has risen for them in their balance sheet as well. Uh, slippages are up nearly 25% sequentially. Annualized slippage ratio is increased to 3.5% versus 2.9% in the previous quarter. The EEB stress uh, pool, that has increased by 19% quarter on quarter. Asset quality also saw deterioration 45 basis point increase in their gross NP ratio on a sequential basis. Back to you. All right, uh, Abhishek, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, so I think it's going to be about uh, financials all the way through. Uh, well, Vivek is now joining us on ITD cementation, uh, that transaction finally coming through. Vivek uh, had reported and told all of you uh, about this earlier. Vivek, congratulations. Tell us. Well, good morning. That's right. So, ITD cementation will be in focus. Remember, in July 2024, the parent company, that is the, the Thai company, uh, Italian Thai Development, had informed the exchanges that they were looking to go ahead and sell stake, the majority stake or the controlling stake in the company. Uh, September, you know, we had told you about how Arani Group had emerged as a front runner, and yesterday the company has informed the exchanges that the promoter, Italian Thai Development, is going to sell the entire 46.6 percent stake to Arani Group entity known as Renew XM DMCC. Now, this particular stake sale of the promoter entity will be happening at 400 rupees a share, which is quite a steep discount to the CMP of close to 540 rupees a share. Along with that, given that there has been a change as far as the controlling uh, of the company is concerned, uh, Adani Group has also made an open offer to acquire a further 26% stake in the company, and this is at a, a, a premium to the current market price. The share price uh, you know, of the open offer is at close to 572 rupees a share. Uh, now, when you're talking about the deal market cap, remember the promoter deal market cap at close to 400 rupees a share works out at 25 times you know fi24 eps uh, at market cap of close to 600 800 crore but when you're talking about the open offer market cap you know much more palatable close to 36 times fi24 eps close to 9820 cro crore rupees is where they are valuing the company for as far as the public shareholders are concerned all right uh, thanks a lot for that vivek and congratulations on that news break well, here's a quick recap of all the top stocks that we're discussing. We're looking at ICICI Bank, RDC, Sriram Finance, Bank of Broda, and ITD Cementation. Five to the green side. Then there are five to the red side as well. You have Coal India, Interglobe Aviation, DLF, IDFC First Bank, and Bandhan Bank. So that's about equity. But let's hop across to Manisha Gupta, who joins us as always to tell us what's transpiring.
in the commodities market. Manisha, morning. Morning, Nigel. Thank you for that. Well, the strength in U.S. dollar index, which is trading above 104, has one, been one of the reasons that you have seen commodities start with a decline across in the Asian markets. While it is the same case for precious metals and the industrial metals as well, but the deepest of cuts clearly seen in case of the crude oil price is 4.5% down in Asia right now, and previous week was a 4% gain. So in matter of first hour of trade in Asia itself, we've completely taken off on what was seen as gains in the previous week. We also are trading at a two-week lows right now. Now, the reason for decline has been Israel's strike against Iran, which has been seen as less severe. It has avoided all nuclear and oil facilities. And for the time being, the Middle East tension seems to have eased. In any case, the markets are looking at higher uh, uh, supplies in the global market. The demand has continued to decline. The OPEC and the IEA have constantly cut uh, demand growth expectations for this year and the next year as well. And that has continued to weigh onto the market. So a 4.5% decline is what we are working with right now. And the rest of the time zones are yet to open. The markets do expect that uh, in the Eurozone and uh, as the New York markets open today, you could be looking at for the declines continuing here. All right, uh, Manisha, thank you very much uh, for that. Appreciate it. You know, at the at this and this has happened before. Uh, there seems to be uh, this seems to be. I mean, the attack seems to be coordinated. I mean, uh, elements of coordination, not completely coordinated. It's like a tick, uh, a tit for tat. Uh, sort of Iran uh, attacks, Israel strikes back with some fair warning, and with the assurance that they will not be sort of a strike back. So elements of coordination, and that I think is the big reason why. Uh, I mean, if this is really the end to Middle East tensions, I mean, we've been waiting for weeks on end uh, for this to finally sort of, you know, come to uh, a climax. Is this it? And if this is it, then maybe oil prices uh, are, are uh, you know, pricing that with about a four and a half, five odd percent cut uh, this morning. We'll take a quick commercial break here. We're going to come back and discuss all of this uh, with Prakash Devan, uh, with uh, some individual stock names as well. Stay with us. Welcome back. Hope you're having a good morning. Well, we've listed all the top stocks that we're tracking. And now we have Prakash Thiwan who joins us to help us out with some fundamental stock talk. Uh, hi, Prakash. Good morning and good to see you in. Well, Prakash, the result over the weekend that the bulls will be clinging on to is ICICI Bank. Large weight on the Nifty, on the Nifty Bank as well. And those numbers look quite good. I think one of the brokerage notes that I was reading said it's in a league of its own and a world of its own as well. What's your view uh, on, on this name and the numbers that you saw? No, absolutely, Nigel. I think the numbers uh, come as a big relief, uh, especially when you have the likes of Indescent and IDFC just gone by. So for every say you also have some of these other names uh, that <clears throat> make you worry. But you know what? What it tells you is that it's only few of the large private sector banks that will be able to manage to scrape through this uh, season where credit costs have gone up. There's, there's absolutely no doubt uh, lending is becoming difficult. If you look at the pressure on NIMS, uh, it, it's it's so distinct. Even some of the NBFCs have reported that, uh, but the bigger ones have probably managed, like Sriram Finance, for instance. So I think what it tells you is that uh, money will flow into the more resilient, larger uh, balance sheets, which which will be able to get through uh, through this difficult phase. Uh, Q2 is usually not the best of seasons for banking, any which way. But uh, I think if they if they get up for Q3 and Q4, given these numbers. Probably you'll see a lot of capital allocation come their way. So I'm, I'm quite, of course, everybody is very happy with the numbers, but uh, uh, it offers probably now uh, a very good risk reward uh, at these levels, uh, given these uh, stellar numbers. Uh, there, there have been improvements all across, whether it's credit quality, whether it's the uh, ability to garner deposits, which HDFC Bank also reflected. So I think the larger private sector banks, the top three, if not the top four, <clears throat> barring Kotak, I think that that's where the money should kind of start coming in. Uh, these numbers definitely corroborate that. Okay, that's uh, ICICI Bank. Uh, Prakash, good morning and happy Monday to you. You have such a huge barrage of numbers to go over, right? Uh, what about some of the weaker ones? Uh, tell me what you think, if any of them, I mean, whether you'll be sort of optimistic and buy the dip. 
there is IDFC first. Now the asset quality issues are real. But uh, I was going yeah. through some of the notes because if you if you go through the other parameters, for instance, their margin is actually pretty okay. On the retail side of the book, they've done fairly okay. The problem is all MFI. So there's IDFC first. There is a Bandhan Bank, which is also weak. Credit access, of course, very, very weak in terms of asset quality. So what thoughts on uh, any of these names? No, I, I, good morning, Sophie. So I do agree, you know, MFI as a pocket uh, is something which... Uh, which is kind of adding up to a lot of stress. In fact, Q2 is probably just the beginning. Q3 will probably see all of these stresses peaking out. And, and you've got Digan coming. I'm sure he'll be able to throw light on the worrying part of uh, this entire space. Uh, he tracks it so well. Uh, I, I personally feel if you if you look at these numbers, it's it's definitely another uh, you know reminder that you need to stay away from this space, which has been struggling. And remember, Bandhan Bank, the likes of Bandhan Bank have had some very positive news flow as well. But these numbers tell you that uh, end of the day, markets track uh, as, as slaves to earnings. And, and if earnings are going to be disappointing, all the good news that you have, whether it's change in management, whether it's you know the RBI uh, uh, forbearance, all of that is not going to kind of matter so much. So I think people will stay away uh, en masse from from uh, this space. Uh, there's nothing really much from you know from if you take. Uh, some step away from the NBFC side or the banking side. Uh, some of the disappointment that you saw uh, the numbers uh, post market on Friday. One of them was Indigo, and and I I don't know if you've spoken yeah. about this already, but uh, but but I think you know that's where you would kind of look at a bad quarter for reasons not related to performance, but you know more operational issues uh, related to aircraft grounding and unavailability of engines and all of that. I mean, and you, you you know you keep getting surprised when Indigo was charging so much. What is it that's making it lose money? Uh, and, and that's exactly what will probably correct itself at some point in time, provided, of course, crude uh, remains uh, under a lid, because that's that's the other worry part that's coming. The market will probably react negatively. But I would believe for long-term investors, uh, Indigo becomes a worthy uh, uh, stock to look at for the simple reason that these things could correct. Uh, they will have to correct. And when Vistara and Air India start uh, having their operational merger, uh, effectively next month onwards, I think it's going to be an opportunity. The the opposition, the competition will blink, and Indigo could probably make some ground, uh, uh, some more ground in in terms of market share and all. So I am quite positive on the future. Uh, this opportunity probably is worth it uh, right. in terms of taking that risk. And I think uh, oil being down five percent this morning uh, also perhaps uh, helps, right? So Indigo maybe reacts uh, early on as it always has. So many quarters we've seen. Uh, big sharp cut and then uh, you know it kind of uh, recovers. We'll see. OMCs perhaps are the other pack you should keep an eye out on because they've fallen quite uh, quite a bit uh, over the last from the recent highs actually. Names like IOC, HP, etc. Prakash, uh, you know, have you? I don't know if you've looked at the overall damage the broader markets have seen and why don't you identify one or two ideas? You know, from what has suffered damage, what looks good? Not day-to-day -day kind of earnings reaction, but from highs, we've had stocks falling 30-40%. Anything looking interesting to you? So, Prashant, you know, it's it's quite interesting uh, the way the market's kind of giving you this. Suddenly, we, uh, we're all waiting for this opportunity. It's come uh, with, with such a massive uh, bang. And, and, you know, the worry is people start looking at uh, a further cut. You know, wherever things have fallen and they want to buy into it, there's always this human tendency to wait for, a, you know, a deeper cut. Uh, and get a bargain. But I think from uh, the setup that we see, you know, if you look at GMDC or you, even a small chemical company like Privy uh, Speciality, uh, you know, I think if you look at the earnings growth, uh, two quarters have already clocked, uh, you know, most of 80% of what last year they did in terms of profitability and uh, EBITDA. So, you know, there are these uh, green shoots in some other spaces where Things are looking up, and they've also got this greenfield project, which is underway. So, I, you know, if you look deeper, there will be opportunities, uh, and the price cut just makes it much more interesting. So, uh, yeah, 20, 30 percent, 40 percent cuts from values, you know, and that's all PE contraction in some of the names. So, look at, I'm, I'm, I'm very clear, wherever the PE is contracting, the EPS is growing. It's a great combination to look at. Uh, so, these so couple of names. GMDC, do which is the, which is the second one? Sorry, I missed it. A GMDC and Privy. Privy Speciality Chemicals, Privy. Privy Specialty. It's, uh, it's a small okay. company, but uh, you know, in, in the fragrances and flavors segment, and 
I mean, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it hasn't been talked much about because there are lots of things which were going in terms of capex, which was done and stuff like that, which has started to uh, start uh, reflecting into the numbers. So you you probably have a couple of good quarters going forward. Okay. All right. Prakash, request you to stay with us. Let's get uh, going on a chat with Sirma SES. Well, the numbers, the positive part was on their margins, which after five straight quarters of seeing contraction did pop up. To understand what went on in the past quarter, what's the way ahead, we're joined by Mr. Jasbir Singh Gujral, who joins us on the show. Hi, good morning, Mr. Gujral. Thanks a lot for joining in. Well, let's clear out a couple of numbers. Margins, they are bounced back to normalized levels, which is encouraging. Should we expect it to hold around these levels or improve in the second half of the year? Point number one. Point number two is the revenue guidance earlier was 40 to 50 percent. Sticking to that. Good morning and always a pleasure to speak to you. Uh, as I had alluded to in my Q1 earning call, the margin profile of the company is dependent on the verticals which form the sale revenue for that particular quarter. In the first quarter, we had a bump up in the consumer segment, which pulled the margins down. Now we are coming to a more normalized uh, product mix of sales. And we believe that going forward, we will achieve the guidance which we have given on the top line, which is about a 40-45% growth to about 4,500 crores. And a uh, beta mar- uh, uh, figure of 310 to 320, which translates into about 7%. Uh, we are confident of achieving that. Quarter on quarter, whether it remains 8.8% or it comes down to 8% or gets a further bump up would depend upon the composition of the sales. But on an analyzed basis, we are very confident of uh, delivering what we have uh, guided the street. That's, uh, that's on the top line. So you're sticking to 40 to 45% on the top line. Uh, what about margins? Uh, and that will obviously, like you're saying, it depends on the, the business mix. So if we talk yeah. about full year FY25, what is your targeted mix? Will a consumer uh, stay at around 40% or are you looking to pull up and you know do more business in the segments where you have better margins? And which would be your highest margin business if you could tell us that as well in the mix? See, we believe that this year consumer would be around 40%. Q1 it was 54%, Q2 it is 33%. We believe it will be around 40 odd percent. And with 40 odd percent of high volume consumer mix, we are uh, on track to deliver the guided beta, which is 310 to 320 crores, which translates into about 7% of the top line of 4,500. Uh, which is uh, the second part of my question was that while consumer pulls down your margin, which are the most margin accretive businesses? Is it industrials? Which is the other segment? Uh, it's healthcare, medtech, exports, design engineering, okay. followed by industrial, followed by automotive. And okay. each one of these comparatively high margin business has seen a uptick in Q2. Mm. For example, my automotive business uh, this quarter constitutes about 25% and my industrial about 29% against 23% in Q1. And going forward with the orders in hand, with the approvals which we have got, we are confident that even if the consumer business is at 40 odd percent or little above 40%, the growth in these segments will sustain us to deliver the guided beta. Okay, 7%. Uh, uh, Mr. Gujral, good morning. Prashant here. So, uh, uh, beyond, uh, any, any thoughts for 20, how will this margin trajectory move? I mean, what can, uh, what can this get up to internally? Uh, do you have, can you get into the double digits over the next couple of years? That is one. And exports is about uh, 20, 22, 22% of your revenues. That grew only about 3% compared to same period last year. I'm talking about Q2 numbers. Could you give us a sense there? See, we had a subdued H1 for exports. Q1 was comparatively weaker. Uh, Q2 has seen a rebound. And this rebound, we expect, will gain momentum in the coming two quarters. And we expect that exports by the end of the year would grow by about 20 odd percent, whether it is 20, 22, uh, that 25, that's the only thing. But exports will grow. We have grown exports by about 19% CAGR till FI24. FI, uh, and we expect that this year also the exports 
would grow, the second half would be much better. Right. But your what second question, or rather, the first yeah. question of the margin guidance for the next two years, we believe we should continue to strive to grow beyond the guided margin for this year. Now, whether it comes to seven and a half, seven twenty eight, I really can't commit. But if the seven is the bottom. Uh, which we will deliver on the expanded revenues of 40-45% growth year on year. Okay, all right. Mr. Gujral, a couple of other aspects that I wanted to ask you on. Uh, is there a PLI amount that you have booked in the past quarter? If yes, how much was it? See, PLI we have booked, uh, and I think it's about uh, 15 or 4, 12 or 15 or crore rupees of PLI amount. All right. And it's recorded in your revenues or other income? Uh, as per the guidance, it is recorded in uh, other income. Other, other income. All right. Other operating other. income. So it's part of the same. It's not clubbed with the main revenues. It's uh, guided, uh, included as other operating Got income. Got it. Also, if you could tell us, uh, Jory Digital Healthcare Limited, uh, did it contribute in the past quarter? Yes, if you could uh, quantify that. See, we see as a consolidated figure, it contributed to the profits as per the guidance which he had given. Uh, I would, since you have raised the JDHL question, I would like yes. to share with you that in the last quarter, uh, we got a PLI approval for two medical devices, which are related to cancer, radiotherapy, uh, and uh, what you call heart monitoring and other things. Uh, is, uh, this PLI for these two devices, I believe is a very, very significant achievement because okay. it will enable the company to target these two segments in the coming years. I Got don't it. see uptick because of this in this particular year, but going forward, it will go up. And okay. I'll also Got like it. to tell you that we opened our design center in Pune dedicated to medical devices. Correct. And the initial right. response of design and development services from global clients in Japan, Europe, and America has been very, very encouraging. Got and it. we believe this will form a decent amount of our revenue streams in the coming years. All right. So that's progressing as per plan. Very quickly, just one final number. What is the current order book? The current order book is about 4,800 crores. We booked okay. about uh, 1,200 or 1,100 or crores in the current uh, quarter. Uh, okay. I personally don't believe that order book in the EMS space is a real area of concern. Okay. I think there is enough business to be picked up. You have to work for it. Uh, but okay. the order book is Got healthy it. and it is uh, yeah. a good composition of the high margin and the better margin businesses. All right, Mr. Gujral, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate you uh, being here. And uh, thanks for that uh, Thanks for that uh, sort of explanation and the perspective. Look forward to our next conversation. Take a break. We are back with uh, Sudarshan Sukhani and Mitesh Thakkar for some technical trading ideas that is coming up. Stay with us. Okay, welcome back. Uh, there's what uh, nine minutes to go for the market uh, pre-open session to kick off. Mitesh and Sudarshan are with us with uh, what they'd want you to do as we kick off another session, another week. Gentlemen, good morning. Uh, good to have uh, both of you here. Mitesh, uh, what would your advice be? Morning, Prashant. So, you know, uh, we kind of met the target which I was looking on the downside. 24.350 was the first one, 24.200 was the second one. And yesterday, or rather on Friday, we got a closing of 24,180. Now, with this fall, the Nifty has come to a trendline support area. And uh, my sense is that uh, around these levels of 24,070, which was the low on Friday, I think we might not break these lows and give a bounce back first. So I've started turning slightly positive on Friday as well, but then there was a fall. Uh, but I maintain that stand and suggest that uh, long positions could be explored with a stop below 24,050. And now I look for a bounce back to about uh, 24,350 to begin with. But in a good case scenario, 24, 750, range could be visited. So maintain a slight positive bias on the, on the market unless until we start trading below and breaking below the Friday's low. 
Okay, all right. Uh, Sudarshan, what about you? What would your index uh, strategy broadly be? Yeah, good morning. See, the market has been falling, and uh, up till now, there has no been, not been any meaningful support level. Every support level defined has been broken. Now, it's anybody's guess if 24,000 will hold. But for traders, the fact is that the market is, the Nifty is deeply oversold. It is much more significant for me than uh, the breach or not, uh, not being breached of a support level. So the Nifty being deeply oversold and world markets being a little cheerful, it's worthwhile finding out if a long trade will work. Now, it may not. It means you just keep a tight 150-point stop loss and look for a long trade because we are deeply oversold, not because we are at any significant technical position otherwise. It's worth finding out. Mm, okay, yeah. Now, indeed, I mean, it was uh, really troublesome for the bulls last week. Gentlemen, good morning. So, let's uh, come down to some stock calls as well. Mitesh, give us your calls and also just throw in a word on say a Bandhan bank or an IDFC bank because a lot of these lenders have come out with slightly negative news flow with the earnings today. So just yeah. in terms of the chart setup, what they look like and then of course your calls for the day as well. So IDFC First Bank, I am looking at a target of around 62 to about 60. That is where the breakout had happened last and there was a weekly gap which was not filled. That should come in as a support area. So another 3-4 points decline, maybe 5 point decline could happen over here. Uh, Bandhan in fact, you know, is uh, slightly uh, in a scenario when... Uh, there's a declining trend line support area around this 160 mark, but uh, I'm not sure whether it will hold or not. In case it starts breaking below 160, then I think, you know, look for uh, much lower areas of uh, sub 150 as well. So the chart structure is weak. IDFC First Bank, I think around 60 should, uh, should you know, kind of uh, stabilize and try to give a reversal from there. And on the stock side, I have a buy on ABB. Uh, it's declined a lot last week. Now it, uh, it is at good support area. So buy here with a stop at 74.40 for targets of 7,700. ICICI Bank, it's been sideways, but the numbers are good and the consolidation should break on the upside today. So buy here with the stop at 1240 for targets of 1290. Uh, Coal India is the solitary sell call with a stop at 468.5, sell for targets of 440. And a buy on a conditional buy on City Union Bank, uh, if it starts getting past 173, 173.5, take a long position with a stop below 170 for targets of 180. Okay, all right. Uh, got that. You mentioned ICICI Bank. I was going to ask you for levels, but that's one of your uh, calls on the long side today. Got that, Mitesh. Sudarshan, coming to you. Uh, stocks for the day? Yeah, first of all, a view. And that is that if, uh, assuming if the markets are bottoming out, and that could be a process, then the focus should be on outperformers, relative outperformers, which will move up the first. Underperformers will catch up much later. That's a general principle I would suggest viewers should keep in mind. By buying ideas are much more than the short selling ideas. Short selling is only one voltas intraday short with a stop above 1800. PD Light is a buy, buy up with a stop under 3135. HCL Tech from that pack and HCL Tech has been outperforming. It's a buying opportunity with a stop under 1800. ICICI Bank is a buying opportunity. Uh, it's the same chart I guess we are all seeing with a stop under 1220. So three buys and one sell. Focus on the buys. Uh, Mitesh, uh, your IOC, HP, BPs, uh, any, any thoughts on these three names? So I think, you know, I was in fact uh, looking at the charts. They've been slightly weak, but with the crude decline, I think a pullback, at least a short covering rally could happen. The best place here looks IOC, which could possibly head towards 152, 153. And if it crosses that, then we'll look at higher levels. Uh, BPCL and HPCL between the two, I think, you know, uh, they could give a mild bounce back. Uh, BPCL, for example, the supply pivot is around 321, 322. So that's the target area for BPCL. And uh, similarly for HPCL, I think we could uh, 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 we could possibly see a bounce back uh, to about levels of uh, 396, 395 volt uh, zones. Uh, gentlemen, uh, we'll speak again. Thank you very much for joining us with your individual trades and, of course, view on the index. We take a break. Uh, Digant Haria of Green Edge Wealth Services joins in on a discussion on Q2 earnings from the financial space. ICICI and Sriram stand out and, of course, uh, some misses there as well. All of that coming up with Digant in a bit.
Welcome back. Well, in a few minutes from now, we'll get the opening rates, pre-open rates, and uh, we'll also get you some of the top stocks that we're tracking. But for the time being, let's get back to our chat with Prakash Sivan. Prakash, I wanted to ask you about metals as a pack. Now, NMDC, even in my Friday's trading session, if I'm not mistaken, the stock was more or less flattish. It didn't correct. And Nalco actually has seen some selling. Though I'm telling you what, the second half of this year or maybe the next three, four quarters are going to look absolutely splendid. Alumina short supply is going to help them deliver a very, very strong set of numbers. The stock around this 210, 220 rupee mark, what's your view on either of these names? And also if you want to chip in on Godavari Par, came with their numbers over the weekend. It was a disappointing set, but to no one's surprise, though they've skimmed down on their guidance. So, Nigel, uh, I don't know if you recall Nalco the other day, uh, I briefly mentioned, uh, you know, from the metals back, this probably stands out as uh, one of the most promising. Uh, various reasons, of course, the alumina shortage, the huge demand in China, which can't just be met, uh, and all the issues that you're having from Guinea. You know, it's it's a, a Cinderella uh, uh, kind of a you know setup for these uh, guys. They they have also got their capacities, augmented capacities, operational. Uh, all of that is going to start reflecting in H2 uh, FI25 onwards. And at this level, at this level, look at the resilience. Uh, Nalco used to be at about 227 or something when you know the market lost so much ground and it just lost about three four percent. This tells you uh, that nobody is willing to give uh, give up on the holding that they have. The the constitution of the business uh, and the shareholding pattern, both as a combination, tell you that this is a great place to hide. Uh, you know, JSW steel numbers from the metals back is something which you if you dissect. You'll probably find that there some, you know, what what optically seemed disappointing is actually not. Uh, there are uh, quite a few decent uh, <coughs> metrics that have improved out there. We'll of course have to uh, listen to the management to understand the way forward. But I think metals as a as a pack is something which you have to see allocation come to, uh, given the fact that they've they've corrected from peaks uh, and the setup is improving. It's just that I think most people would be waiting for the November U.S. election outcome to figure out how China behaves. That's a big elephant in the room right now. But otherwise, I think from a non-ferrous space, uh, Nalco stands out as probably one of the best picks. We'll have a new listing today, uh, Prakash. Vare as well. Uh, much touted. Uh, the guys who got allocated well, they're going to be very, very happy today going by the premiums that we are, uh, you know, we, that we've been hearing about. Uh, but this sector itself, you know, it seems it's got a lot of tailwinds. I'm looking at some of these companies, the way the profitability increases once scale uh, goes up, it's tremendous, you know, doubling a profitability on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, your view first on Vare post its listing and anything else you like from the broader markets in this space? So, you know, Nigel, what's going to, you know, every day you see these targets are power generation, uh, keep getting up uh, and, and ferociously, you know, by the government estimates and by all other means. Uh, now, that tells you that it's actually going to be contributed by renewables. There's no doubt that this is going to happen. And there's a huge value chain uh, out there. I would believe Wari uh, is, is definitely going to be a key player, but uh, it's something where, you know, people have probably priced it to perfection at this point in time. So, uh, from from the listing level, I don't know how, where it gets listed. We'll of course just a few more minutes and we'll get to see that. But after that, uh, you'll probably have to take a call. How does it stack up with some of the other players? And remember, this space is getting to be extremely competitive. Uh, you know, end of this year we'll have Reliance announcing a lot of developments around that. So things will probably be very different in terms of supply. But my sense is the transmission side on renewables is something which uh, is, is still underinvested, and that's that's where growth is going to be huge, uh, whether it's transformer, whether it's BSS, you know, th th there's so much that you can talk about there. But uh, we'll, we'll, of course, have to kind of start looking at bottom-up uh, basis also while the sector has huge tailwinds, as you rightly said. The headwinds are most uh, stock-specific, while the tailwinds have been sector-specific. So that's that's where you'll have to make a little bit of a judgment call, but it's it's quite promising in that side. And there are lots of players that have come in. A lot of them, if you take the marginal smaller players out, even the larger players, you know, even if you invest in an REC, for instance, there's nothing wrong. I mean, it sounds boring, but, uh, you know, that's that's the space that's going to continue to grow at a scorching pace. So I, I'm quite positive on uh, picking those kind of names, but we'll, we'll have to wait to see the earning season go through for uh, identifying some real uh, winners out there. Okay, all right, got it. Uh... Prakash, indeed, I mean, Wari, I think uh, it's been lapped up big time, but the issue is pricing, like you're saying. 
it's a profitable company, profits are rising, it's hitting the sweet spot in terms of renewables. But yeah, at what price is it good? And I think the market will answer that question today. Thank you for joining in. We look forward to connecting again soon. Uh, but um, as we start getting in our first pre-opening rates, let's actually go back to that uh, important conversation that our colleague uh, Malvika Jain had with the RBI Governor Shakti Kanta Das. He was uh, speaking on a whole host of issues. Now, uh, Governor Das has been ranked as a top central banker by US-based Global Finance magazine. Malvika uh, caught up with him in Washington, D.C. And the governor sounded fairly optimistic on growth, saying that inflation has started moderating and that uh, there are significant risks to the outlook on inflation. Take a look. Inflation management by stability is our primary responsibility, keeping in mind the objective of growth. At the moment, as we stated in the last monetary policy statement, as I have said, the growth and inflation component of our mandates are well balanced. They are well poised. That, so therefore, we changed our stance to neutral. Now we have flexibility. We have now flexibility to watch the incoming trends and to sort of assess the evolving outlook and decide on what policy we will take. Now, growth is doing well. Inflation also has started moderating and we expect the inflation to moderate as we go into December, November, December and into the last quarter, last quarter of this financial year. We expect the inflation to moderate, but then there are significant risks. I have stated it in my monetary policy. Right. Significant risks, again, arising out of geopolitical conflicts, out of geoeconomic fragmentation, weather-related events, and, you know, certain data which was released by the FAO with regard to food commodities and by the World Bank with regard to certain, certain commodities like metal prices and all, they have shown quite a bit of uptake. So, therefore, there are significant risks to the inflation outlook. We expect and we are reasonably confident that inflation is moderating, but then there are significant risks. So we have to be very careful. And we are in such a place, you know, such a position where growth and inflation is so sort of well balanced that any premature move can upset that balance and, uh, you know, can affect uh, our objective of uh, achieving an inflation to reach the target of 4% or go close to 4% target. So, sir, if I could summarize that, uh, you feel that the growth momentum will continue and inflation is likely to come down. That's right. And until and unless there are some external factors which are beyond uh, the control of the domestic economy, we could see a rate cut in the coming year. Oh, rate cut, when it will come, I would not like to cut. <laughs> okay. I think that will be a giveaway. <laughs> and again, in all seriousness, I think it depends on the incoming data. And based on the incoming data, the, what kind of assessment, what kind of outlook? Because inflation, uh, you know, policy, monetary policy making is always forward looking. Right. We have to see what is the situation six months down the line, down the road. What is the situation one year down the road? So based on that, we, you know, we determine and decide the future outlook. So based on that assessment, we will take a decision. I cannot give as to when we will do a rate sure. cut or uh, we will not do a rate cut. I cannot say. We expect inflation to moderate. We have to be very careful. We have to be very watchful of the evolving outlook. And we should not do, as I said again, I'm repeating, we should not do anything in a haste, which uh, will sort of again put us back in our objective of achieving the inflation target. In fact, it's it, interestingly, the household, uh, you know, the inflation expectations of households are also well anchored okay. at the moment because the household inflation expectations are, you know, moderating for almost uh, every round of survey. The household expectations are moderating by 10 or 20 basis points for the last uh, two years. So we are therefore very, we are very, uh, we are maintaining constant visit. We are watchful. We have to evaluate the risks and see how the risks are playing out. And based on that, when we have greater confidence of the inflation aligning with the target, that would be a time where we, you know, we will see. Okay, all right. Uh, well, you can hear from uh, the RBA governor on various issues, moderating inflation, but the risks around it on the domestic economy doing well, positive, significantly outweighing negatives when it comes to festive season demand. Catch excerpts from that exclusive interaction with the RBA governor all day here on CNBC TV 18. Okay, so that's the big exclusive of the day. But uh, right now we're going back to all those granular details coming through on numbers. Lots and lots of BFSI names have come through. And as we introduce uh, Digant Haria, 
founder at uh, Green Edge Wealth. Uh, the pre-open rates have started coming. So just let's quickly uh, do a roundup of what uh, the market is indicating, starting with ICICI Bank, 2.4% 2, 2 higher on ICICI Bank uh, because of the kind of classy numbers we've seen from the lender. Uh, yes Bank is actually up 5%. There's some asset quality issues there as well. Bandhan in the pre-open suggests it will have actually a bit of a green take. You can argue that Bandhan has already fallen so much that a lot of this perhaps is already in the price. But uh, for IDFC First Bank and for Credit Access Grameen, no such luck. These two are reacting quite negatively to the fact that slippages have risen, gross NPAs have risen, credit cost is rising. So let's discuss all of this with uh, Degan. Degan, thank you so much for joining in. So I was just sort of giving that as a context in terms of how the stocks have started reacting to the numbers. Let's start with the IDFC first. And the interesting aspect here is that clearly the MFI portfolio is under stress, which is why slippages are higher, credit cost is higher. Uh, the question is, can the retail book make up for it? The fact that margins have been pretty steady, can that kind of offset the weakness? How do you look at IDFC First Bank? Yeah, morning, Surbhi. Uh, before, uh, before I talk about IDFC, I just want to put a context to all that is happening. So if you look at all the results which have come, the secured lenders have actually done quite well. So, you know, someone like, say, an ICICI Bank or an REC or a Sriram Finance, you know, they do not have a lot of personal loans and microfinance loans. And which is why, you know, they have done reasonably well. Even HDFC Bank reported good asset quality. They did not see any much deterioration in the uh, asset quality. But if you look at the entire unsecured pack, you know, right from, uh, you know, a credit access to a fusion finance to uh, IDFC Bank, Ratna RBL Bank, Indusind Bank, see all these banks derive a lot of revenue from unsecured products, personal loans and microfinance loans, which are very, very high yield products. And I think the pain here is Surbi just getting started. So there is, uh, you know, not much hope in these uh, counters for the next six months because, you know, the first bad quarter, the problems don't end. You know, the balance sheet problems take longer. So for IDFC Bank, they have the largest unsecured business loan slash personal loan portfolio, which has been originated by DSAs, the direct selling agents. It's a kind of book which we do not consider as a, uh, you know, a very, very superior kind of book. So I think the problems for IDFC are today just in the microfinance space. They will spread over to the personal loan and business loan space as well. So I think uh, it's a long way to go before, you know, the asset quality signals become green. I think we just entered the red zone. We will remain in the red zone for some more time. Okay. Uh, Digan, hi, morning and uh, season's greetings. Uh, Diwali wishes to you and your team, your family, uh, your own uh, festive attire. Uh, Digan, so, uh, you know, so, so, do, so what's a, what should be the strategy for investors and financials here? Uh, it's, it's more of, I mean, I, ICICI and Sriram are standout results from what we've seen over the weekend. And I think you put the context very well there. Uh, so, so from an investment point of view, uh, what's the thing to do from here incrementally? Yeah, so... Uh, morning, Prashant, uh, and Shubh Dipavli to all, you know, to you and the team at CNBC. Uh, uh, so my uh, my take here is that, see, uh, secured lenders are doing very well. So if investors in this lending space, I think secured lending is where they can be. But see, the commercial vehicle finance, the CV finance and the home finance space are reasonably well priced. Uh, there's gold finance companies, you know, someone like a Muthut Finance, uh, they do not have a lot of baggage of microfinance and other such portfolio. So I think they, that can do really well. Uh, apart from that, see the large banks, I think large banks can make a comeback, especially the pack which includes an ICICI bank, HDFC bank, SBI, Bank of Baroda. Uh, I think these are the ones who have consolidated well and they did not report any asset quality issue. See, ICICI was a blowout standout performance, but uh, HDFC was not. It's just that they did not do, uh, you know, they did not do worse, uh, you know, compared to what the street was expecting. So, so I think the large banks can make a comeback, but that's, you know, more of a 10-15% kind of a return, which is possible here. But for people who really look at, uh, you know, a broader market or, you know, small caps, mid caps, I think turnaround opportunities is what people have to look for, you know, something like a JM Financial, you know, some banks like DCB or Karnatak Bank, you know, which have not gone overly heavy on personal loans, microfinance. I think they may start reporting, uh, you know, better numbers and turnaround in their performance. So I think the, sec the space to avoid is personal loans and uh, microfinance for now. And uh, everything within everything else, I think gold finance and these large banks and some of these regional banks, they can, you know, they can become good investments for investors. 
Okay, hi Digant, good morning and always good to see you. And since you briefly mentioned gold finance, the bigger one is Muthut Finance, but Manapuram has its own set of problems and that stock has seen a sharp correction. Valuation though, it could get some support at these levels. Wanted your view on that one. And the casualty of Friday, Indicent Bank, the numbers were weak, but maybe had an element of market weakness as well because that stock got absolutely knocked back. Uh, your view on both these two names. Yeah, so uh, morning Nigel. Uh, I think, uh, see this Manapuram Finance, you know, the gold loan part is doing well, uh, but the microfinance portion is what give pain. And see, now they cannot do any new loans. RBI has stopped them from giving new loans. So the pain in microfinance will even be accelerated. So the question we always ask is, can the pain in microfinance be offset by the upside in gold loans? I think yes. Uh, you know, so valuations are absolutely attractive. But, but you know, whenever such problems happen, they do not resolve in a jiffy. Uh, I think if somebody has a six to nine month, 12 month outlook, I think there's some money to be made. But then Nigel, who's to say that, you know, gold prices will keep on rallying for the next 12 months, right? So I, so at this juncture, even though Manapuram is very uh, cheap, uh, we still feel that, you know, Muthud is a better ride for the next six months. And, you know, maybe somewhere later, once microfinance bottoms out, uh, Manapuram can be a good bet. Uh, second, coming to Indusin Bank. See, Indusin Bank derives a lot of profits from the microfinance two-wheeler finance and CV finance book. Uh, the microfinance book is in deep pain. And see, typically, Indusin Bank has always a weak liability franchise. So, you know, the interest rate cuts are not happening. The deposit rates are not coming down. You're not see seeing easing of the deposits in the system. And which is why I think Indusin Bank, definitely it can bounce back a little bit, you know, maybe 5, 10, 15 percent. But beyond mm. that, the long-term outlook still has yes. some more time to come green. All right, Digant, always a pleasure talking to you. Thanks a lot for joining and giving us your take on the private, the public, the MFI segment, and a lot of those gold financiers as well. Time to go to market opening. Well, uh, I think the uh, right on cue, we've got the opening bell coming up, a third of a percent higher, uh, half a 0.4, almost there. So 24,285. Good to see some green straight off the bat. The Bank Nifty is up a half a percent as well. Uh, so 51,000 back at about 51,100 with this 0.5-0.6% uh, pop that we are seeing. Uh, Mid-cap index is up about a third of a percent. Uh, and uh, market breadth is e one is to one, but more up than down. Uh, last few sessions, we've been uh, straight uh, straight away uh, down with uh, more down than up. So 100 triple-digit gain after a while coming through on the Nifty, and that's just about 0.35%. Look at uh, the Nifty heat map. About 35 odd names are uh, 36 odd names in the green uh, and a minority in the red as we begin this uh, session. So it's going to be all about financial straight up and uh, they're at the bottom of the screen reacting to earnings. Survey. Okay, before earnings, two important announcements, Dr. Reddy's and uh, Reliance. You're seeing very different rates because Dr. Reddy's has gone through a stock split and Reliance's uh, X bonus. Uh, so therefore, the rate on Reliance is 1, 3, 2, 4. Uh, okay. We'll just uh, look at the uh, the change rates. Coal India is reacting negatively, down 2.5% on uh, numbers. JSW Steel is down about 2% as well. ONGC is weaker. So a lot of the commodity-facing stocks starting the day on the weak side. LNT is the other one that's negative for the time being. On the upside, Sriram Finance, 5%. So the markets really liked uh, the performance in the second quarter. ICICI Bank, obviously, we've been discussing great set of numbers, 2.5% up over there. Uh, BPCL, remember, some of these oil marketing companies fell very sharply just as numbers were coming through for BPCL and HPCL because of massive inventory losses in the second quarter. This morning, there's a bit of a leg up because anyway, crude oil prices have you know, cooled off almost 4.5-5%. BPCL is up and about, SBI is up, m and is up about a percent or so. So these are some of the early trends that we are getting. Uh, for the time being, the Nifty is managing an 80-point bounce. Well, a few accidents actually from the broader markets. You know, we need to take note of that. Uh, Interglobe Aviation, the stock is down now 9%, so massive hit is what we're seeing out there. IFB Industries, the margins have come down to around 5.6%, the standalone margins. I think Aquarius was working with a number of around 8%. So that one now is down closer to around 14%. Remember, IFB Industries is one of those stocks that have created big, big wealth, but that one, in fact, you know, now, it's now down close to 14%, so that deserves special mention. Sonal had told us that Tatwa Chintan as well, those numbers were disappointing, so that's down closer to around 8%, Odd. Uh, you have Godavri Par and Ispat. Well, that one as well is pulling back considerably as we speak. The problem was in the past quarter's numbers. However, the way ahead will look much better for Godavri Par and Ispat because 
I don't know, prices have moved up. Pellet prices have got some base as well. So that's why, you know, I think the stock started off in the red and now it's pulled back a little bit from the lows of the day. Now down only around 2.5% after starting off close to 7% uh, lower. Managar gas is close to, down close to around 2%, but there are some winners. And I think today the sector of the day could actually be OMCs. They got smashed in the past week. Remember, the market sentiment was weak. Inventory losses higher than estimated as well. But HBCL is now up close to around 4%. There's an upgrade as well that's come in from Aquarius. So that stock, in fact, is now up close to around 4%. DLF actually is reacting positively to its numbers. It's up close to around 2.5%. And Amara Raja as well, up 2.5%. Guys, some green on the screen. The bulls will like it. Mm. Uh, Interglobe, Nigel, did you check? Sorry, yes. I, I missed. Yeah, still down, still down to, uh, yeah, 10% right now. It's, yeah. a, it's a big cut, no, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, the uh, the two uh, standout performers, large ones, are uh, ICIC and Sriram. Uh, and both are, for many, many quarters now, absolutely rock steady with their performance, operating performance. Uh, yes Bank is up uh, 7%. Yes Bank uh, is, is coming up with large volumes. Bandhan is up about 6%, but Bandhan, you know, it's it's uh, it does jump around uh, once in a while, but then uh, it's still not very far away from its COVID lows. Uh, DLF is up about 2.5%, 7.95 on DLF uh, coming through. Uh, and these oil marketing companies, we were talking about this uh, from the morning, all 4% higher, HP, IOC, BP. Uh, you've got, uh, what else, Shakti Pumps up 5%, UTI, AMC is up 7%. So 12.22 on UTI, AMC. Sirma was with us, the management was with us on the back of earnings, 7% pop on Sirma, 406 we should actually look at Dixon as well because Dixon numbers were very strong uh, and we had them up on Friday 8.30 in the morning and the stock ended 10% lower. Uh, Dixon is flat right now, so nothing uh, on it uh, for, uh, for at this point. Uh, on the other side, uh, apart from I think what we've already looked at, Poonawala FinCop is down 8.5%. Poonawala FinCop uh, 272 and uh, that's a large cut, million and a half shares already traded. I think uh, Nigel already mentioned ITD, 4%, 5% lower, 508. Look at Phoenix Limited, uh, the mall operator, 7% cut in Phoenix, and that's a large uh, name. Uh, so uh, under 1,400 with that cut. And of course, I mean, the credit access and the Indigos and IDFCs, and I mean, those, of course, are Coal India. I mean, I think we've uh, run through some of these names uh, in any case. Action Construction Equipment is down 5 IFB is down 14%, but I think IFB had one of those 15% pops yes. last week. So there's a bit of a reversal coming through. Praj is down 4%, so it's a pretty vibrant screen as we look at the first few minutes of market open. You know, on ITD cementation, I just want to mention the pricing. Mm -hmm. uh, at its peak, the stock touched almost 640, 642, 643. The deal has happened at only 400 rupees per share. So I think that's something that could perhaps weigh on the market's mind. Though the open offer, there's no problem because, I mean, you simply go by the formula, you calculate. The open offer is coming in at 571. But the value that Adani is uh, you know, ascribing to it is 400. And I think that's saying something for a stock that went up to 650-odd. You know, I, I recall, uh, I think, close to 18 months or 24 months ago, I gone to the management's uh, you know office and uh, we did an interview from there at that point in time the stock was 130 140 and i said you know the parent is in trouble is there a possibility that you know they look to bail out because this is an asset that had good order book and at that point in time they said unlikely when this announcement came that they wanted to sell actually the stock was at 570 rupees on that day yeah. you know so those who are waiting for the deal it's uh, been quite tricky for them because finally that deal is announced at a pricing which is fairly okay from an open offer point of view but the way the stock has rallied 4x in, I think, less than 24 months explains why we are seeing some profit taking after that sort of a rally. You know, Indigo is limit down 10%, yeah. uh, right? And uh, that is that is telling uh, because, uh, yeah, numbers are, uh, and there are some earnings cuts if you see if you read uh, analysts uh, for 25 and perhaps for 26 as well. Uh, but at the margin, I mean, this entire talk of maybe a little bit of consumer slowdown, uh, you know, are, are, uh, will that show up in... Uh, aviation as well, because that's been one of the strongest areas of uh, consumer spending. Uh, so we'll have to see. Let's welcome in uh, Tahir Bacha, who's with us, CIO at Invesco Mutual Fund. Tahir, good to have you with us here. Thank you for your time. So 10% off, broadly 10% off from the all-time highs, Tahir. Uh, what have you been doing? And uh, how much how much cash is uh, Invesco sitting on? Uh, another uh, sort of, uh, you know, fairly mid-sized mutual fund that we were talking to last week was saying that we are... This is, I think, on Wednesday, they said, well, we're already almost all in. You know, and then, of course, the market kept going a little bit lower. 
uh, but you can never time these things. My question, I'm also asking you this question be is because uh, if the foreign selling doesn't stop and all this paper issue ends, will the dry powder with mutual funds start to run thin? Go on, Tyre. Yeah, so Prashant, I think uh, first off uh, on the issue of cash, I mean, typically as a policy, as a house, we don't really uh, take cash calls on the market. We've not even done that in the height of the COVID, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 decline that we saw in the markets. So uh, essentially, I think uh, we just try to uh, mitigate risk if at all we see the possibility of markets being even elevated in the short run or something to see if, uh, you know, the portfolio itself can take care of that uh, through adequate diversification and probably moving into certain pockets of value if at all we see some uh, at that point in time. So I think uh, that's generally our approach. Uh, uh, cash is not something which is a very important play as far as uh, we as a house are concerned. But uh, yes, I mean, we are in a situation where probably, you know, uh, uh, more than flows and uh, uh, you refer to you know foreign uh, inflows and the paper floating around, et cetera. That's always a little hard to tell and uh, assess in terms of uh, exact demand supply situation. But I think uh, probably that is still a sideshow. I think the more important thing right now is uh, we are in the thick of the earnings season. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a time of the year when we have to actually assess as to what happens when the rubber hits, uh, hits the road. And uh, uh, earnings are going to be important, therefore, to that extent. So they, they've always been important, but uh, I'm just saying that uh, if this is a time when the market would want to see if uh, uh, what valuations are being accorded to different companies are are uh, in line with what their earnings delivery is. So I think this is the phase that we are going through and we're seeing some, uh, uh, we've, we've been in a somewhat mixed uh, trend zone across different kinds of sectors. Uh, and I think that probably is a trend which might probably continue for another couple of weeks till the time the result season uh, lasts. Mm. By the way, there's a big move now on some of the you know top large banks. Uh, look at SBI. After the move on ICICI Bank, I guess the market wants to be with really strong lenders. And therefore, even HDFC Bank is now positive. HDFC Bank was one of the best contributors last week, was trying to battle for the bulls throughout the week, barring Friday. Uh, that one's showing some green, but SBI is the one that's really on the move. Bank Nifty is up about one whole percent. So that's the market. And even on the mid-cap screen, the way the stock prices are turning is telling you something. The mid-cap index for a flash dipped into negative, and there's immediate buying that's come back through. And look at the reaction to stocks like Bandhan, stocks like Yes Bank. The market's mood this morning seems to be buy the dip, buy wherever. Perhaps the worst of it is over and done. It's all out. The closet cleaning has happened, and it gets better from here on. And I think that's the... Uh, the assumption or the call or the punt, whatever you want, might want to call it, that's what the market's doing with names like Bandhan and even maybe a Yes Bank. Uh, Tahir, great to have you on this morning. So that's the debate. Let's talk about that, right, on financials. It's murky, it's messy, it's not at all uniform this quarter. What is the approach that you would take? I mean, would you be in the camp that would be willing to buy where the pain is already, all of it or most of it is already out? Or would you stick with pristine uh, sort of names where there are no asset quality issues or the best-in-class franchise? Well, at least, uh, I think as far as uh, leveraged businesses like financials are concerned, we would rather stick to where we see the trends to be reasonably clean. I think it, it tends to become a little difficult to call out things very early in situations where uh, banks are not, or any of the, uh, not just banks alone, but any of the lenders, are, if at all, are not doing well. And to take a call that, you know, things will reverse uh, uh, is a little difficult. And um, so I think we generally try to avoid uh, some of those pockets as much as possible. Uh, I, I think as far as uh, we are concerned, we've got a, uh, you know, we've got a reasonably balanced allocation, uh, uh, not really being part of many of the accidents right now. And uh, I, I think uh, uh, this is what uh, that, you know, like, as you said, that, you know, trends are really quite mixed. Uh, they're, uh, uh, the last week ended on a somewhat, uh, you know, uh, somber note uh, with regard to financials and asset quality. And then there was... Uh, some bit to cheer and uh, reassurance coming from some of the larger uh, banks as well as a couple of NBFCs and with regard to asset quality. So I think uh, that's going to be the sign ocean nonetheless. Uh, but uh, it is uh, there are certain pockets which are clearly under stress. And when we are talking about MFI and a few other segments uh, lower down the curve, uh, then there are some others which are actually uh, you know not too bad. But I think the more important message which the market is trying to give, uh, not just in financials alone, but even in some of the other sectors, is that wherever execution is strong and where challenges are being met uh, uh, quite well by the by the companies and the managements i think those are uh, those are getting rewarded and on the other hand uh, you know there are two situations where things are uh, not likely to go your way you're going to get punished if 
there's going to be a disappointment or if at all you know uh, uh, the future looks a little murky in those situations and the market reaction also tends to be very uh, very uh, you know uh, severe as we can see from mm. uh, individual price movements yeah absolutely just on yes bank quick quick note why is the market rewarding it so much because there's nothing messy in yes bank uh, the margin is very steady the slippage ratio has actually improved a little bit so there are no hidden skeletons no nasty surprises it's all steady in an otherwise very volatile sea so maybe the market is really you know uh, in a good mood with that yes to yes bank today not yeah. to that point should be but yeah. uh, tyre hi welcome to the show tyre before we let you go i wanted to ask you about interglobe aviation that's the accident of today it's been the one that's gaining market share the only way to play aviation suddenly now you have spicejet that's managed to raise some money and pay back their loans uh, what's your view on the space after these numbers we saw from Interglo? By the way, it's down 10% now. Your take? Uh, so I'll, I'll avoid individual comments on stocks, but in general, the sector uh, you know has uh, seen a fair bit of uh, vibrancy, and uh, you know it has been a proxy play as far as travel and tourism is concerned. And obviously, uh, you know the number of opportunities in this uh, segment have been limited, and and therefore we we, we have seen uh, some of the strong executioners and the early leaders. Are doing well in this space. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, in general, we are seeing some bit of. Uh, I, I think I heard Prashant say that a little while ago that you know there is some uh, pressure that, that seems to be there as far as uh, discretionary spends are concerned, and uh, maybe that is kind of unfolding a little bit here, and that too, that that has also probably uh, shown up in the commentary of some uh, some of the enterprises, uh, both in aviation as well as otherwise. On the other hand, for example, in FMCG, we've seen some companies call out a, a rural versus urban divide, where rural is starting to somewhat get a little better, whereas urban is, um, you know, uh, a little, a uh, little soft. So I think divergent trends uh, or some reversal of trends rather uh, are developing, where rural is starting to look a little better at the margin compared to probably urban, and that uh, is also influencing uh, some of these Indeed. businesses, uh, which are, you know, in the thick of their consumer, at least the high end or mid end. Right. Uh, consumer yes. discretionary, you know, uh, right. uh, uh, strength. Okay, Tair, thanks a lot for joining in a short, but, uh, you know, valid inputs coming in from you. Wishing you a good day ahead, and we look forward to having a chat with you Diwali rather soon. Diwali. Happy Diwali. Well, let's uh, move on. Let's talk about JSW Steel then. The numbers actually were better than what we were working with, particularly from the standalone business on an EBITDA per ton basis. Mr. Jayant Acharya, the joint MD and CEO of JSW Steel joins us. Hi, Mr. Acharya. Good morning and congratulations on a good quarter in a challenging environment. Now, since the second half is expected to be much better than what we saw in the first half, could you brief us on the price increases taken in October 2024 so far? The last quarter was a challenging quarter uh, with respect to the overall economic scenario globally, as well as the uh, challenges being faced by high exports from China. Uh, so we had an inflow of influx into India because India is probably one of the few countries which is growing at a fast pace. Uh, that resulted uh, basically in uh, sentiments dropping and the prices dropping in India. Uh, however, uh, post the uh, announcement of some Chinese uh, China stimulus package, uh, the sentiments have improved. We have seen some international prices going up in China, um, which has also translated now partly into India. So in October, we were able to increase the prices of flat steel and long steel between 1,000 to 2,000 rupees per ton, uh, which uh, uh, basically is, is, we feel, in a seasonally strong uh, quarter ahead, uh, quarter three and quarter four. The demand is usually stronger, so we feel that is something which will go down. All right, sounding optimistic on pricing, but what about the benefit of coking coal in the past quarter? What was the savings out there, and what are you bracing for in terms of coking coal cost for the second half of this fiscal? In the past quarter, uh, you know, although the price uh, of uh, steel fell, we were able to offset that uh, through a cost reduction. One of the enablers was cooking coal, and cooking coal uh, prices in the last quarter went down by $27 per ton, more or less as we had guided. Uh, going forward in this quarter also, we expect uh, cooking coal prices to moderate somewhere in the range of $20 to $25. Got it. So then that, you know, higher pricing and lower input costs will help your spread. So we're bracing for that in the second half of the year. What about volumes? Any change in your guidance? Also, exports as a percentage of the mix has come down to 7%. Will it continue to remain soft? Yes, I think the CapEx, uh, we are seeing improvements on the ground. And that is why you see the long product prices having stabilized. 
and uh, going up marginally. But let's keep in mind that the price increase of long products or flat products, what's happened in October, is on a very low base, which was exited in September. The prices had come down over the last few months, and that is now coming back to, let's say, reasonable level. I would, I would uh, say uh, reasonable levels at this point of time. But yes, the demand on long products is reflecting the improvement in CapEx uh, uh, spending. Uh, the second thing is, uh, with respect to the international market, as you know, the international markets have been weaker. Uh, the demand, uh, because the economic backdrop has been weaker, geopolitical risks are more challenging. So therefore, the uh, demand has been weaker. On top of that, China, because of a local demand issue, has exported more steel. But the good thing is that uh, I think we have seen China production moderate over the last two months, it has come down to 77 to 78 million tons in August and September from a peak levels of 90 million ton plus. So that hopefully will result into lower exports as we go into the winter season, that is one. Secondly, we, we see that uh, more and more countries are raising barriers uh, because that's impacting their uh, uh, institutional profitabilities. We expect, uh, you know, we are engaging with the Indian government and we have taken some steps uh, in some anti dumping actions on some products. We are engaging with the government to at least uh, find a, a level playing field with respect to uh, low priced imports, which is coming into the export side. I think the domestic demand growth in India, which has been about 13.5% in H1, is basically reflective of a very strong demand. And this is, remember, Nigel, on the fact that the capex in the first half was slightly weaker than expected, whether disruptions were more. In spite of that, we ended the year, uh, September, six months, with about 73 million tons of demand, which is actually a very strong signal. So we could use the opportunity of, let's say, to realign our products to the domestic market and thereby you know, switch to more domestic. That's why we had about 93% of domestic and 7% of exports. Also, it was impacted, as I said, by weaker international demand and lower prices in the international market as well. Okay, got that. Uh, you know, but your subsidiaries, both uh, Bush and Power Steel Limited, as well as your quoted division, they delivered actually a weak performance in the past quarter. Obviously, there were a couple of one-offs as well. Will they improve in the coming quarter? Yeah, so uh, BPSL, uh, there were some one-offs, which, uh, you know, so we had a shutdown in BPSL, which was a plant shutdown. The second thing, when we started the oxygen plant, uh, there were some delays in stabilizing the oxygen plant, so we had to procure industrial gases from outside. That resulted in uh, higher costs. So these two had an impact on the profitability. Now that the plant is now stabilized and the capacities are fully in place, BPSL will certainly be showing better numbers as we go into the second half. As far as quoted is concerned, uh, quoted, I think on a per ton basis, the EBITAs have improved actually if you see quarter on quarter. On an absolute number also, I think uh, uh, basically the volumes were lower in quoted, uh, impacted by international, uh, let's say lesser exports. But in the H2, we expect uh, quoted numbers uh, also to improve uh, as the seasonal demand picks up. All right, Mr. Acharya, so we got that about your subsidies, but what about the international operations? Both US as well as Europe are quite weak. Should that improve from here on? International operations uh, impacted again by uh, prices, mostly, uh, let's say, in US. US, uh, the profitabilities uh, were negative uh, at about 11 million uh, odd dollars. Um, uh, Italian operations did still... Uh, moderately okay, but again impacted, although the volumes were higher, operationally we were fine, but international prices were lower, so the profitability came down to about 6.2 million or so. Uh, in Ohio, we also had a maintenance shutdown uh, in the month of September, which also impacted the volumes. That also resulted into a little higher losses. Uh, going into uh, the second half, uh, I would say we are cautiously uh, optimistic that Italy will improve. And I think uh, in, in the U.S. side, we see prices again having gone up uh, on the hot roll coil side. Uh, plates is more or less stable. So we do expect some improved numbers with some additional volumes which will come in the H2 uh, vis-a-vis H1.
All right, I think you pretty much answered everything on the operational performance. Let's talk about your balance sheet now. The net debt has increased, net debt to EBITDA as well has worsened a little bit around three and a half times. Does this cool off in the second half of the year? And are there any plans to raise some equity? In the H2, the uh, volumes will be strong, driven by a strong uh, India demand, strong seasonally second half. Our capacities have come on stream. They will go into operation in this quarter and ramp up in quarter four. So therefore, we expect the absolute EBITDA numbers to improve. That will give us additional uh, uh, amounts to deliverage. The second thing is that some of the working capital which got built up because of the new facilities which came in and also because of lower exports, we expect some inventory dilution and release of working capital. Um, we are also looking at uh, you know various other options to basically uh, look at improving our uh, ratios. And we are quite confident that uh, by the end of this financial years, uh, we will see improvement in ratios. Also keep in mind that in this last quarter where the quarter was challenging, we also uh, did an acquisition of the Lavara Cooking Coal Mine. We also spent on CapEx. In the first half, we have spent about 7,850 crores on CapEx. The working capital also went up uh, and because of some inventory, which also went up, these will get diluted, you know, as we go into the, uh, uh, so working capital release, higher volumes, therefore higher EBITDA will help us to improve our issues going forward. Higher volumes, better EBITDA and working capital release. Uh, debt comes down, but you didn't answer whether you're looking to raise some equity. Not at this point. We are not looking at uh, doing it at this point of time. But uh, if the right opportunity comes, we will look at different ways of uh, looking at uh, a deleveraging uh, possibility. Mm, we'll have to keep an eye out on that. Thanks a lot, Mr. Acharya, for joining in. You're getting for a far better showing in the second half of the year. We'll track you to most of these numbers. Wishing you all the best. All right. Uh, there's an interesting chat, Nigel. Uh, so uh, one of the largest private steel makers in the country uh, in uh, conversation posts their results as JSW Steel. Cholamandalam investment and finance is in focus on the back of its second quarter numbers. Uh, asset quality has uh, deteriorated a little bit. Uh, AUM growth is pretty strong, 30% plus, but dispersal growth rate has come in uh, at a 13-quarter low. Uh, we have uh, Arul Selvan, President and Chief Financial Officer of the company, joining in. Uh, Mr. Selvan, good morning, sir. Thank you for your time. Prashant, this side, season's greetings to you and your team, your family. Uh, good to always speak with you. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the, uh, the disbursement growth, sir, uh, and, and uh, what has happened. Is it just high base, especially in vehicle finance, uh, and what should we expect uh, for the full year across segments? So, uh, vehicle finance, the Q2 will always be a slow quarter because uh, Q1 and Q2s are always slower quarters uh, if you go pre-COVID period and, uh, you know, see our records. Because these are monsoon months and, you know, species, uh, you know, months are also there. So, this time monsoon has extended pretty into September and even beyond September. So, the disbursements have not picked up in the vehicle finance. Uh, and harvest has, all got, has got postponed because of the extended monsoon. This is keeping the fresh disbursements low. Uh, the rest of the portfolio had had a pretty decent growth and uh, you know this would uh, uh, if you compare last year there has been a progressive growth quarter on quarter which is why the base has increased and that's why we have kept our overall full year target at around the 25% mark uh, which is what we still you know, like to adhere to, uh, while the, we have clocked the 33% growth in AUM uh, on uh, first half, uh, we will see a uh, slower AUM growth, while disbursements will, uh, you know, be at a de pretty decent pace across various products. So, AUM growth of 25% in F525? Correct, yeah, yeah. This was our okay. guidance even earlier. Somewhere in the range of 25 to 30% is what we have said. We still maintain that. Okay. And uh, so you said that disbursements will outpace AUM growth. So just to try and understand this gap between disbursements and AUM, uh, disbursals to AUM ratio is around 35-36% right now. Where would you want to see it by the end of the year? No, disbursements will be always slower. See, as we move into larger, longer tenor products like LAP, HL, 
you know, uh, even in SME as well as in SBPL, these are larger, you know, tenor products. So they stay on the book longer. And in an EMI based product, the initial rundown of these will be slower as compared to the lag years. So you will see AM growth being larger in the initial years when you had a substantial growth, which we saw over the last two years when we expanded LAP and HL predominantly into uh, the other parts of the uh, country. And that's what is reflecting in spite of lower AM, uh, lower disbursements, your AM growth seeming to be higher. Even in the case yeah. of vehicle finance, the tenor of products are increasing because of the BS6 norms as well as in passenger cars. So we are moving from the traditional three to three end of year uh, product to two, four and a half to five year product, uh, average tenor across the vehicle finance book itself. So this is why you will see the AEM growth being uh, a higher percentage as compared to the disbursement growth. Okay, got that, sir. Uh, sir, obviously, you deal largely with, uh, you know, secured assets, so no such uh, issues there on asset quality. Even if, if we are just running the numbers as you're speaking, uh, there's a marginal increase in the gross NPA ratio. It's moved to about 3.78% versus 3.6% last quarter. Just give us more qualitative color because that's the biggest worry right now across the system, right? Uh, hurt yeah. in MFI, pain in small businesses, and the worries, and obviously there's unsecured. But the worry is whether this will start spilling over even to the secured side. Because if you're hurting on an unsecured loan, whether you'll start uh, being delinquent even on the secured assets. What exactly are you picking up on the ground and what is your own projection with respect to uh, NPLs? See, our NPLs will moderate as we move into the second half. And this is also the traditional way that things move because most of our customers who are in the rural and dependent on harvest, their earning potential has not picked up for two reasons. One, the rainfall extended into October and there has been, uh, you know, the harvest has got postponed. Also, all of the festivals have moved into Q3 rather than, you know, at least Navratri being in the uh, Q2, you know, in most part of most years. These two had reduced their earning potential and therefore that it had impacted a bit on the collections, predominantly in vehicle finance, I would say. The rest of the portfolios are behaving normal and uh, while there have been a little bit of a creep up here and there, uh, they are well within the uh, our uh, you know, comfort zone. With regard to your question on the spillover of unsecured into secured, uh, yes, it is possible, but the good part for Chola is large part of our customers, as I would say more than 95% of our customers are business-oriented you know, borrowers. So they are dependent on their bureau score and they are well aware that if they default, they will get into a problem of being able to continuously get funding for the business. So only the discretionary spending you know, uh, part of the borrower crowd would be in a little bit of a indifference curve with regard to their civil score being poor. Uh, you know, in a in a sort of a downturn when they they are they tend to move into delinquencies or move into defaults more easier than this crowd. So this is the behavior pattern we have seen, and this is what is a, is a little bit of a comfort we draw that they, this customer profile would make sure that their delinquencies are kept well within control and they don't cross mm. the uh, line to the bureau score. Customer. Got it, sir. So qualitatively, qualitatively, sir, you're not sounding too worried right now. Now, if you could just quantify yeah. that for us as well, what would be uh, the expected, uh, you know, uh, year-end rate on, say, gross NPA credit cost? What are you expecting in the second half? So uh, our uh, our target is to be better than last year. So we will close the year better than last year. So that would be a, a significant improvement in Q3, Q4. So you will see that happening. All right. Uh, hi, Mr. Selvan. Good morning and good to see you. And I want to ask you for two numbers, though. Yeah. You know, your provisions went up to around 620 crores. Most on the street were in the vicinity of around 470 to 480 crores. So that raises the question on credit cost, which was, I think, at around 1.5%. For the year, what will that number look like? Point number one. And the second factor is on your NIMS. Because your yields came down a little bit and your cost of funds went out up a little bit, which caused your NIMS to come to around 7.5%. So 
So what's the guidance on both these two parameters, credit cost and NIMS? So credit cost, we will be in the range of around 1.25 to 1.3% is still what we you know, maintain. As I was saying earlier, the second off should see some improvements on the or a reduction in the NPA numbers. And so that should give us some release on the provisions we have created. So that should uh, result in the NCL numbers being moderate. It would be higher than the 1.2% target we had, uh, you know, uh, tried to, you know, uh, uh, reach for the current year. Uh, but I think it will not be too far away. It will be between 1.2 to 1.3% on the overall average assets. On the NIM side, uh, you will see improvements, especially with um, yields getting improved in vehicle finance as we move uh, into uh, the books becoming more of a higher uh, yield, yield book, uh, which is what is the marginal yields are higher. And and we, you will see that improving in the vehicle finance, the yields improving. And cost of funds, right. in my opinion, should be at the same levels. Uh, the marginal increase you saw in the current uh, quarter is predominantly we did set some amount sure. of uh, tier two. That's the reason. Got it. All right, uh, Mr. Selvan, we'll leave it on that note for today. Thank you very much for joining in and sharing a lot of that perspective on growth as well as asset quality. You need to take a very quick break, come back on the other side, and we'll be in conversation with V. Vedinathan of IDFC First Bank to talk about the trends and the outlook ahead for the second half of the year. Welcome back. Well, IDFC First Bank is the uh, uh, next one on our radar right now. Uh, now, we actually have with us, I think, uh, Mr. V. Vedinathan, MD and CEO of the bank, joining in. Stocks under pressure about 5%. Mr. Vedinathan, great to have you on. You already know the concerns, right? And it's not just with IDFC First. I think system-wide, the issue is on asset quality stress in the MFI segment and wherever there is uh, unsecured lending. So I just want to start with MFI first, and then we'll talk about the retail book, which, which I know has done better. You've increased your credit cost guidance from 2.25 uh, to 1.65 earlier. So how deep and how prolonged can the pain be? What exactly are you witnessing uh, in the MFI space right now? First of all, that 1.65 was, um, uh, was excluding JLG. So including JLG, it was uh, you know, 1.85. Uh, now we're seeing 2.15, 2.2, um, you know, uh, the number you said. Now, um, the, the key thing actually is that um, in the MFI segment, there is a real stress. Uh, we can see it in the market and we can see it in the collection percentages. Uh, and um, we, we can also see it in the SMA. SMA is the bucket pre-NPA. Pre mm -hmm. uh, our number in the last two quarters have increased from 1.6% to like 2.5%. Uh, so we wanted to uh, recognize it, um, and uh, we have therefore provided at uh, 30, deep, 30 days past due itself. Normally, provision start at 90 days past due, and in that also we were providing 75% at 90 days past due, and 100% mm -hmm. at uh, at 120. We have pre-poned the whole thing, and we have taken it 30 days past due, and that is the reason why you see a, a provision increase uh, on the on the microfinance uh, business. Okay. Uh, good morning, Mr. Vaidyanathan. Once again, morning. thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, as you pointed out, the SMA book, you have inc uh, the number has increased. So can we assume that there will be, you know, third quarter will also show higher slippages than second quarter? Uh, we should be very careful about this. It's only the MFI business that has gone up. So let's focus on MFI in this conversation for now because that is the key point of this quarter. So the, uh, we will talk about the rest of the book and uh, we will definitely address that. Now on the SMA front, yes, it has gone up to 2.5, but since we already provided at, uh, at 30 days past you itself, Tata, uh, our, uh, th the next quarter uh, uh, credit cost because of MFI will not be this much. It has to, it has okay. to, it'll come down. Okay. And it'll come no, down. No, I take your point. I, I take your point, but you are assuming that there will be higher slippages. That's why you're provided. So the slippages can rise. When do you see it plateauing yes, off? Yes. Will it plateau by the fourth quarter or will it take even longer? Yes, looks like the, uh, there are various estimates in the market. It's an in industry thing. Uh, but yes. yeah, certainly Q4-ish uh, looks like it'll, it'll peak off. And uh, our, our analysis also shows that Q4 will peak off. And then uh, subsequently, next four quarters, it'll... These are only two-year loans, Lata. 
So, uh, you know, they all have a peak and they go away. But Obviously. incrementally, incrementally, I wanted to share with you that we are ensuring a book with CGFM. We saw this problem, frankly, way back in, in December of 23, our data told us. So we started insuring our book with CGFMU. So already, uh, every booking since January of this year is fully insured. Uh, fully okay. insured means insured. Basis. So therefore, it's not touched sure. 50%. Percent of so, so uh, Mr. Vedanathan, that's I think that's the first part of uh, the conversation. That's a clear headline that you're guiding for MFI stress to peak off uh, by Q4, right? Now let's that's talk our, about... That's our, that's our estimate, yeah. That's, that's your base case. I uh, got that. So now let's talk about the other segments of the book. Uh, tell us uh, trends that you're witnessing on both credit cards and personal loans. What's happening there? That number also we have put out uh, this time uh, publicly. This is a, uh, you, you must uh, see a page number 32 of our investor presentation mm -hmm. where we have given segment by segment SMA and the subsequent page we have given segment by segment product by product NPA. So our whole book is like everything is clear out there. So in the SMA segment, for other than MFI, which went up sharply like this, uh, every other segment, our SMA is very, very good. It's very stable. It's, it's out there in page 32 of the presentation. I saw that. I also saw that, uh, you know, whereas your overall GNPA is 1.92, the uh, personal loan, the uh, consumer loan NPA is 2.08. You have uh, yes. gone to that extent of uh, transparency, and thank you for that. But therefore, the question, since you're acknowledging that the GNPA in personal loan is more than the G overall GNPA, should we expect slippages over there? Uh, well, you know, it's, it's marginal, you know, 1.9 and 2.08. Uh, but uh, our, in the, let me specifically take the unsecured book so that it's an important one and we'll put it yeah. behind us. The unsecured book of the bank is 15%, unsecured retail book is 15% of the book. Okay. Now, on that book, plus uh, we also have education loan, where it induces, uh, induces defined, but that's also unsecured in that sense. We also have consumer durable book, which is induced defined, but we should treat it as unsecured practically because you really can't repossess a, a, a washing machine or or a, or, a, <laughs> or something. So if you take all of this family together, all unsecured put together, this is all put together. Is uh, you know we, you'll find that our NPA is two point zero eight percent. Net NP is 0.5%. So we are yes. watching this very, very carefully. And we are one big beneficiaries of tightening credit policy 12 months before today. Today, if you are smelling good on the rest of the portfolios because the work we did maybe 12 months ago, that we are smiling on the on the, on the the portfolio, excluding MFI. MFI sure. is an issue. Talk about it. But Mr. Vedanathan, to just press on that point, for the un unsecured book in its entirety, which you're saying you're watching very carefully, is the base case that you're expecting uh, some more stress to build up? Are you expecting gross NPAs and net NPAs and slippages to start rising in this in this book as well over the next two quarters? We mentioned the NPA to you. It's 2.08 and, and 0 0.5, unsecured book, 15% of the book. We described that. Now, the um, now away, away uh, from that, see, we'll have to watch it very carefully. Uh, but you, you see, we have not never done the subprime kind of personal loans. You know, it is not that. So, uh, so that is more like a fintech game that they give a loan on mm. the fly immediately for twenty thousand rupees, fifty thousand rupees. We don't do all the kind of stuff. So uh, we expect this to be uh, stable because end of the day, remember the stress is in the MFI segment because too many lenders went there. But in the general mm. segment, uh, you know, the salaried employees, Infosys employee, Wipro employee, Unilever employee, they're all fine. No, I take your point. 2.08 for their uh, consumer loan segment is not sounding alarming at all. Uh, and uh, it's uh, uh, very helpful that you have given that separately. Let me now come to the margins part. It's not reduced much, just four basis points quarter on quarter. But have cost of funds peaked? Or do you think it can still, uh, you know, shave away from your margins? The margin guidance no. is second half? No, we, uh, first of all, our cost of funds, uh, uh, we definitely, we don't expect it to increase from here on. Even last quarter, we did not increase the cost of funds. Just to be precise, our cost of funds is 6.38% uh, cost of deposits. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, cost of funds because of legacy money is 646 uh, or so. So, <clears throat> so that we don't expect it to uh, increase from here. Uh, because we are getting deposits in abundance. I, I think, you know, in, the, in, in this talk, we'll, we missed the point about how deposits are growing. For our bank, Lata, yeah. let me point out, deposits growing with 32% on a base that is now touching 2,18,000 crores. I believe that our ability to raise deposits like this at low cost mm. is a big strategic advantage of the bank. In the in the in the in the milieu of this credit cost of MFI, 
we may we may miss that story so i'm just pointing Point that out no no absolutely i mean your casa ratio is almost at 50% and we haven't missed that mr weather nathan we've taken that on board uh, colleague abhishek is also here some questions abhishek yeah uh, yes. mr weather nathan if you could uh, you know highlight with respect to how much is your cg fmu coverage uh, what i understand from analysts is that it's around 50% if i compare that to peers it's slightly on the lower side uh, could you just highlight on that uh, front please we started this uh, we started stress in mf we started seeing stress in mf sector in december of 23 so every loan book from january onwards is insured by cgfmu uh, since new bookings are insured we have now reached and past book runs off we have not touched 50% by end of this year we'll touch 75% and by like on end of or middle of next year or end of next maybe middle of next year we will touch 100% so but the thing about cgfmu is that the uh, they they there is a one year window in which they they they, they there is a there is a hiatus period after which they settle so the benefit of our cgfmu insurance on our portfolio will be seen by us in fy27 that is 2627 and um, uh, but in the meanwhile we have tightened a lot of controls on 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 mfi credit okay all right uh, mr vedanath we we'll leave it on i want yeah. no wait i'd just like to say one yeah. quick point that sure. this uh, you know one of the reasons we also taken uh, for uh, this why we taken advanced provision on on the microfinance business uh, since we are at it uh, is also mm. that we want our employees not to put any stress i'm using your medium to communicate all our employees in one go that don't put any stress on our customers at this point of time they have their own Got challenges it. so we have taken it up front now we are not under pressure now Got take it. it smoothly give them some time and 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 smoothly take out our money they'll be happy and, and we, we, we should be sensitive and secondly i must say that the mfi sector is being touched from so much industry but it meets three magic boxes tick tick mark check not women on women's entrepreneur micro it's an important segment for india we should learn live and learn but it's yeah. an important segment point taken sir it's just that uh, you know it's a listing time that's why we have to wind up we will invite you again for a more detailed chat thank you very much for joining us mr vaidyanath and that's worry listing for you water listing <laughs> yeah green on the screen on the stock and on uh, you know in terms of the footage as well renewables is a big big space so uh, this is a you know major player when it comes to solar pv modules and uh, it's a profitable company the issue was very well subscribed or almost i think 76 times over good subscription from the retail side from the institutional side and got a good listing on the screen as well but uh, let's quickly move on it's one lender after the next bandhan bank reported uh, what looked like a bit of a weak set of numbers the profit has declined the margin was under pressure as well but the question is is it getting better from here on uh, mr ratan kumar kesh md and ceo at uh, bandhan bank is with us mr kesh thanks for joining in that's really the question i mean even if you see how the stock market has interpreted your performance it is hoping that uh, that you know this will not be a very prolonged asset quality issue Uh, what can you tell us right now in terms of how you're looking at the second half uh, how credit costs will play out and uh, you know what you're expecting in terms of the npl movement as well very good morning to you i think uh, i think our quarterly numbers are in the context i would say it's a decent set of numbers and specifically on credit quality if you see the um, dpd pool has inched up we have uh, fresh slippages at 1100 odd crores and gone up from 900 odd level but what we see is that given the microfinance space and microfinance continues to be a significant part of our current book we expect the uh, the stress to continue in quarter 3 as well but given the offtake and the positive input that we are seeing in collection efficiency in 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 october our belief is that by quarter 4 it should turn it around therefore if you see today uh, on a half yearly basis my credit cost remains in the range of 1.8% our credit card guidance of 1.8 to 2% uh, we are holding it at as of now um and, and our belief is that if quarter four turns around for us as also for the industry we will be able to hold on to that but we will come back with more details as we see the quarter three end and then discuss more about it okay but uh, you said collection efficiency has improved uh, can you tell us exactly how october panned out vis-a-vis -vis september so you see collection efficiency for quarter 2 as well for our largest constituent which is west bengal we are still at 99% which is just about 10 basis point down from quarter 1 and rest of the india it has come down by 1 percentage point but in quarter 
three, we are in October, you are already seeing uh, 50 to 70 basis point improvement in the standard pool. Of course, given that uh, increased DPT pool that we have as of now, yeah. some of these will definitely flow through and therefore we are not isolated from the industry. Uh, having said that, I think we will continue to do be better and our credit cost guidance of 1.8 to 2%, we remain at that range as of now. Okay, just that uh, uh, number uh, for the standard pool, how much has it, uh, you said uh, 40 basis points it's improved. What is the exact number? So, we are at 98 plus to 99 okay. range for okay. Pan India. West Bengal continues okay. to be very high for us, 99 plus. Even that also is improving uh, week after week. Okay. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, just to talk about it, I mean, uh, given uh, the anticipated stress, you're saying credit costs are not uh, increasing at this point in time. Uh, provisioning is also, uh, it was actually down slightly, almost 5% year on year, marginal increase quarter on quarter. Uh, so, what can you guide in terms of, uh, let's say, expected slippages or uh, expected uh, stress in terms of gross NPAs? Is, is there a year end number that perhaps uh, you can look at right now? See, well, gross NPA has gone up from 4.2 to 4.5 already. Um, and our belief is that the slippages will be a bit more elevated in quarter three. But with quarter four and some treatment that we expect to do, we will uh, maintain in the range of 3.5 to 4% by end of the year as a gross NPA. Now, while on the microfinance seg segment, there are a bit of a stress, but I want to just decode that a little bit more specifically for our bank. You see, overall pool that I have, based on the latest scrub, uh, Bandhan, unique to Bandhan Bank customer in the microfinance side is roughly around 60%. Bandhan mm -hmm. plus one is 80%. And Bandhan plus four and above, which is to me the most stressful segment for us, is just about four and a half percent uh, so while i would at one point i would say we are not isolated given the elevated stress in the industry we will be impacted but the uh, but, but but given the guardrails that we have been taking over the last 18 months or so whole bunch of steps that we've been taking we've been growing moderately over the last years whereas probably the industry was growing significantly and some of these would have reflected into overheating and over leveraging. I would mm. say we will still be better than the rest of the lot. And headline cross NPA, we will we have some uh, some thoughts in mind. We okay. will try and maintain it in the range of four to four and a half at the end of the year. Okay. Well, uh, sir so, uh, Abhishek, this side, uh, you had a strong deposit growth in this quarter, seven percent sequential growth. Uh, could you guide with respect to you know what was the incremental cost of funds that uh, you got in this quarter? Because your net interest margin dipped by twenty basis point on a sequential basis, and would you continue to look at deposit growth at this level to bring down your overall credit to deposit ratio? So, any guidance on CD ratio that you are looking by the end of FI twenty five? You can give guidance on CD. I think and as and been demonstrating quarter on quarter strong ability to garner deposits. Our deposits have grown by 27% and quarter on quarter it has gone up uh, by 7%. Uh, yes, there has been a bit of a stress in the liquidity, there's intense competition in the market, but our ability to garner deposits through the franchises that we have built 1700 plus branches, after core transformation, some of the products that we have launched, and many more products are actually coming on the transaction banking side. So some of these coming through, some of the old branches we are re-energizing, the separate sales team created. Uh, I think our ability to garner deposits will continue to be up. Our guidance is that we will grow our advances at 18% plus minus one, and deposit will grow faster than that. Therefore, CD mm -hmm. ratio will continue to keep coming down. We are not giving a guidance at this stage given the overall macro, uh, but I think we will stay definitely uh, in the range of nine, below 90% as of uh, by end of this year. Just one number, NIMS, net interest margin. So net interest margin, see this quarter also we have Guidance. delivered uh, like 7.4% down from 76 But if you have to look back one year back, it has gone up from 7.2 to 7.4. Our view is that uh, whatever happens, our cost of fund obviously has gone up. It has gone to almost 7%. No, sir, we are running out of time, Mr. Kesh. I just wanted a guidance. Guidance is 7 to 7.5. 7 
Okay, that la large range. Thank you very much, Mr. Kesh. We will invite you yet again when we have more time. The market, of course, has uh, given a thumbs up in terms of stock price, but that's because Bandhan took a huge beating after the indices numbers. Cheap valuations. And, yeah. uh, that's, valuations uh, are cheap. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it could also be, but it could be just short covering because it was already sold off. Um, Quick break, and we will have Bitesh joining in. Welcome back. Interesting moves playing out on the large cap screen. It's actually banks which are seeing a lot of buying, including at Indusind Bank. Look at the Bank Nifty. It's leading the Nifty from the front. The gain on the Bank Nifty is well over 1% and the Nifty is up about 0.3%. So it's a day that belongs to the financials and the larger ones are attracting plenty of buyers. Mitesh is back with us. So let's get some trading calls going. Mitesh, so interesting uh, setup as we speak. What would the calls be now? Yeah. Uh... So I think, you know, uh, Sulvi, uh, I was talking in the morning that, you know, we are at a trend line support area and good chance that we'll see a bounce back. My sense is that we are still doing that. And, uh, you know, if as long as Friday's lows are being protected, uh, I would, you know, bet for a test of roughly around levels of uh, uh, 24, uh, uh, 350 and in the best case scenario, even 24, 700. So in that sense, we are trading with some kind of positive bias. One traders should look at uh, booking profits in short positions if they were carrying and sell only if Friday's low is being broken. And two, I think, you know, even explore uh, patterns when the fall was very sharp, the stocks were oversold and some kind of reversal is being made. And that's how we're approaching it. So I have right now a buy call on Britannia. I think, you know, one stock which collected very sharply from uh, uh, 6,400 plus levels to about 5,500 levels. Now is giving first signs of reversal. So buy here with a stop below uh, 5670, look for a bounce back to about levels of 5775, 5780 zones uh, on the upside. And the other stock, you know, which I like uh, is uh, uh, is a buy on uh, Dabur. Uh, that's also a stock which is collected a lot and is making first signs of, you know, uh, some kind of base building around these levels of 536. So try to buy slightly lower around 541, 542, buy with a stop below 535 and look for a pullback to about uh, 5.57.60 or so. Okay. All right, Mandesh. Thanks very much for that. We'll connect later in the day. Right now, a quick break. We'll come back on the other side and look at the earnings uh, of Bank of Baroda. Welcome back to our earnings central. At a time when many banks, as we just saw, are struggling with asset quality and high slippages, especially in unsecured, Bank of Baroda has actually reported about the best asset quality in a decade. Uh, the loan growth at 11.6% is a little slower than peers like uh, ICICI Bank and HDFC Bank. But uh, let's discuss the fine print. Joining me now is the managing director and CEO of the bank, Mr. Dev Dutt Chand. Mr. Chand, good morning and thank you very much indeed for joining us. Well, let me good start morning, with Dr. the asset quality. Yeah, uh, let me start with the asset quality, which is uh, quite stunning. The slippages are, I think, uh, 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 lowest in three quarters. Uh, can you tell us the breakup? Uh, where uh, did you see any pain in unsecured, for instance? No, the asset quality, as you see, uh, Lata, actually uh, one of the best quarter we have. Uh, particularly, uh, there has been a good recovery out of return of accounts. Mm -hmm. So that supported the other income also, uh, if you see the numbers they are in. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of the slippage, our normal run rate is roughly around 2,700, 800 crore per quarter. Mm -hmm. And in case you see last two quarters, the slippage has been almost at the same level. Yes. So uh, in terms of any, uh, I mean, again, 70-80% uh, of the slippage would be uh, account less than 5 crore. So, uh, uh, in terms of the quality of the book and the fresh slippage, I don't think uh, will exceed the run rate going forward. That is what the uh, expectation at this point of time. Okay. As far as unsecured personal loan is concerned, yes, uh, as I said, uh, I talked to uh, when the market in last September 23, mm -hmm. we clearly said that we are going to moderate the growth on the unsecured personal loan. Mm -hmm. And that has a positive impact in terms of the fresh slippage now. And uh, the fresh slippage this quarter is hardly around 200 crore out of unsecured personal loan. But let me again tell that uh, the book has been much better as compared to the book we had earlier. 
So I'm not anticipating any uh, elevated slippage out of the unsecured personal loan book. Even if so, uh, it, it will be very insignificant for my book as a whole in that matter. Okay, that's good to hear. Uh, but uh, you just referred to recoveries. Can you give us an idea of, uh, uh, you know, what is the expected, what was the recovery and what is the expectation for the full year? See, particularly if you uh, look at the item uh, that uh, the recovery of TWO account that we have given for this quarter, our normal run rate is something around uh, 750, 800 crore. Mm. And this quarter it is almost like 2,500 crore because we got uh, recovery from a couple of good accounts, uh, which was one was particularly in the NCLT framework. Mm -hmm. So in that scenario, uh, if you look at my normal run rate also, uh, we are fairly uh, like you are looking at the GNPA trending downwards for last many quarters now. Mm -hmm. uh, the net NPA uh, position is improving. Mm -hmm. uh, we are giving on the asset quality, we are giving two ratios, which you are again uh, coming true for quarter to quarter. One is a slippage ratio. Uh, we want to maintain the slippage ratio between 1 to 1.25. At the same time, the credit cost that we said will maintain below 0.75 and this quarter it is 0.65. So fairly, if you look at the parameters of the asset quality, we are fairly balanced. Mm -hmm. And uh, the normalized uh, kind of a slippage and the normalized kind of uh, the recovery would continue to be there for the book. No, I take all that. I'm just saying that since the recoveries have been stunning, is there a number you can guide for the full year? Since you still have a lot of NCLT accounts. Yeah, uh, that uh, we 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 uh, anticipate to have a recovery uh, target of twelve thousand crore for the full year. Okay. And at the same time, containing the slippage uh, somewhere around nine thousand to ten thousand uh, okay. for the full year. Okay, that's good to hear. So, uh, in net net, you are gaining. Uh, let me come to the uh, interest margin. Uh, you uh, your deposits have obviously been slower at uh, less than ten percent, nine percent odd. Uh, do you see that uh, margins can still be under pressure? Are you expecting that deposit cost can still rise? Let me give the full context of it. Like, uh, uh, we had given a deposit guidance of 10 to 12 percent earlier. Mm. And uh, Q1 and Q2, uh, the growth has been lower, obviously. Mm. Uh, so, we uh, calibrated the, uh, the deposit growth to 9 to 11 percent now. And consequently, uh, we, we, we revised the, the, the advanced growth also from earlier 12 to 14 to 11 to 13. Mm -hmm. The precise reason for this is uh, with regard to how to maintain the margin therein. And if you look at the margin that we have achieved this quarter is 3.10, which is the lower band of 3.15 plus minus 5 BPS. Even if the impact of the panel interest and charges has been almost 5 BPS. So in a scenario like that, uh, our efforts to maintain the margin going forward, that's the key primary, one of the objectives that we are running by doing a trade-off between the growth and the margin. Mm -hmm. So uh, we continue to maintain the same margin guidance, both uh, 3.15 plus minus 5 BPS. And I think uh, the, the, the uh, kind of a, uh, asset liability management, we can still maintain that. Saying so, there are two uh, assumptions that we uh, focused going forward. Mm -hmm. As you see, globally, uh, there has been moderation happening on the asset pricing and also liability pricing. Uh, India, I think, uh, it has started now in terms of the regulator changing the stance now. The system liquidity is better month to month as compared to the earlier months. In that scenario, uh, we still expect uh, uh, some kind of a moderation on the cost of deposit, maybe towards the, the late Q3 or the early Q4. Okay. And if that happening, uh, I think uh, we'll be in a position to maintain the margin guidance of 3.15 plus minus 5 BPS. No, at 3.15, you'll actually do better than what you have done in uh, the second quarter. But right now in the third quarter, deposit costs are still higher. I mean, are you, uh, are you likely to pay a little more? Can they increase even from current levels? Uh, to my view, uh, that may not be the scenario. I think uh, as far as the economy is concerned, the deposit rates have picked out. So uh, uh, the many of the banks are running the festive campaign and post-festive campaign, I believe uh, there would be moderation in the cost, uh, particularly in the peak rate side okay. on the deposit. Okay, that's good to hear, uh, at least uh, from a banker's point of view. Uh, but uh, uh, do you ha what is your percentage of loans tied to EBLR? Because in, if, if the rates indeed get cut, then uh, there can be a problem for banks, at least for a brief period. What is your uh, bank's uh, percentage of loans tied to external benchmarks? See, uh, my MCLR book is almost 47% and EBLR is 33%. Right? So uh, there are a couple of scenarios. Uh, many loans are tagged with the EBLR. So uh, 
if there is a repo rate cut, uh, like after three years, you can still reset the spread. So uh, we'll just see how to maintain the margin going forward because there is a lag in terms of uh, the advance pricing and the deposit pricing that we see. I mean, that's that's there in the Indian market. But I think uh, banks will be in a position to manage asset liability in a manner where they will protect the margin. Okay. Uh, yeah, I take your point that you will be able to reset, but uh, uh, and not everyone is betting that a repo rate cut is coming anytime soon given uh, the food inflation. Let's look at the uh, advances growth. Uh, where do you see growth picking up? I mean, uh, you have done as, as well as the system, but it is still slow at 11.6. What is the year-end uh, expectation of uh, loan growth and where, which sectors do you see demand? Let me uh, slightly give an update on this 11.6 percent. My uh, domestic credit growth is 12.5 percent, and uh, we said earlier we want to moderate on the international book, and they are actually the growth is uh, around 6.4 percent, uh, leading to the global book at 11.6 percent. Otherwise, the growth has been very strong as far as the domestic book is concerned. Uh, within the domestic book, again, we maintain that uh, we'll grow uh, higher than this. Uh, there are the components where we want to stick to our guidance that the retail continue to grow higher than 20 percent, which has been there for many quarters now. Uh, the agri and MSME, which is almost at 11 percent, want to grow at 12 to 14 percent. And mind you, again, we're uh, getting into the busy season two quarters, Q3 and Q4. So I believe the agri and MSME would be uh, higher than the earlier quarters in terms of the growth. The only uh, uh, keeping the overall uh, guidance at 11 to 13. And the only uh, a book which can uh, slightly can see a change is the corporate book. And uh, the element which again, uh, because I have a very uh, primary objective of maintaining the margin also, and the book which can see some kind of a realignment can be the fine price book. Obviously high quality, but fine price book. So with this, I think uh, we'll be growing higher in segment where uh, the economy uh, wants, I mean the productive sector of the economy wants the money to flow in. Uh, so there the growth would be uh, significant. Um, corporate book, particularly the uh, the refined deal or the uh, fine price deal, we may realign based on the growth guidance. International, as you said earlier, because uh, that has two impact on my book. And the international advance, one is a uh, global uh, credit deposit ratio, it impacts. At the same time, the global NIM also it impacts. So we announced earlier we want to moderate that, we have moderated that. Because of that, the overall book is slightly uh, looks 11.6 percent. Otherwise, the domestic book, uh, the growth is quite strong. Fair enough. Uh, very quickly, uh, any problems that you may have, any uh, lingering problems with that Bob World issue you all had two years ago, are all that sorted out? Yeah, that's uh, long before it is passed now. So okay, okay, nothing. fine. Fine. No spillovers uh, into the PL. No, no, okay. No. Uh, the uh, final question I want to ask you is on capital. Uh, the market has been kind, uh, well, not very kind to banks, but uh, you could use this excellent results to uh, raise capital, will you? As uh, earlier also we said, as far as equity is concerned, uh, banks here has been quite robust for many quarters, many years now. And uh, uh, the new investment accounting also putting a lot of money into the AFS reserve and uh, pushing up the, the, the CRR in the matter. So in that scenario, uh, we do not have any plan to raise equity, although I know uh, price-wise, uh, index-wise, market is uh, very good at this point of time. But we do have mandate from the board, which we have announced to the market, to raise 81 uh, uh, and tier 2 to the extent of 7,500 crore. And as on today, we have not raised anything. Obviously, for next two quarters, Q3 and Q4, we'll be raising this money. Okay. Well, there are. Uh, it's the, one of the quandaries of market is that when it is kind enough to give you the money, you don't need the money. When you need the money, the market is not very kind. But, yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, just the uh, uh, final point on Reserve Bank regulations, uh, draft rules that are expected. If the LCR rule comes, what will be the impact uh, on your bank? And if the project finance uh, uh, draft rules are uh, made permanent then what can be the impact on the bank? So coming to the project finance, uh, uh, let me, although we do have uh, back of the envelope calculation, but we're not announcing to the market. So we're just waiting for the circular to come in and thereafter we'll announce that, or the impact and all. As far as LCR is concerned, that's a, a real because a liquidity LCR is one of the very important, uh, what you can say, parameter vis-a-vis -vis the market. So uh, currently we're maintaining almost 123% LCR. Uh, in case the draft guidelines comes into being, then the impact would be 12 to 15 percent, right? But our normal uh, uh, that uh, uh, what you can say the guidance is to maintain LCR something around 115 percent to 120 percent. 
So a scenario where the, uh, the circular is coming into effect, then possibly we have to slightly uh, improve our HQLA, which okay. the bank would do at that point of time. Okay, well, that could have a margin impact, but we will discuss it when it comes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chand, for joining us. Uh, that's uh, a very confident, Mr. Chand, telling us that uh, they are going to keep their asset quality and perhaps even improve it uh, margins at 3.15 plus or minus five ba uh, basis points. That's a very encouraging uh, set of guidance. On that note, we wrap up on Bazaar. After a break, Chartbusters.